Greetings and welcome back to another discussion. Today I am very pleased to be joined by someone who's very knowledgeable on uh, several topics, namely Northern Ireland, Scotland, and the contemporary political scene. And we also share the bond of great antiquity in as much as we both remember a time before mobile phones and the internet, as he is even older than I am, apparently. And uh, I think we're going to just launch right into it. I, I think as the audience tends to not be overly fascinated by so-called boring historical details. Um, he's going to be covering, I think, the vast majority of Northern Ireland, but I just want to say that uh, Northern Ireland this didn't exist in a vacuum. Um, if you don't know any of the history of Northern Ireland, I'll give a really brief summary of how these problems came to be, and that is primarily in the 17th century. Uh, there were large waves of migration from the mainland, in the majority uh, low, lowland, lowland Scotland and these people had a Protestant background and, and, and a different cultural background and they settled uh, these are the Ulster Scots of course in, in that area and they haven't really left since and to this day they make up the so called unionists, uh, unionists make up the majority of the population and that is basically these cultural differences these different backgrounds that is the very, very brief version of why there's any problem whatsoever. So I'm going to hand it over to Jabba, because he knows far more about the modern situation than I do. Uh, so we've arrived in the 20th century, after the the Ulster Scots and others have been there for a few centuries, and and both sides don't like each other very much. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, all righty. I'll, I'll I'll just backtrack slightly, just 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 uh, uh, just to set the scene a little bit. Um, now, what a lot of people perhaps don't realise, if, if I go back historically, you know, don't, don't you worry, I'll soon be uh, back up to date in no, no time at all. Um, now, people may recall Robert the Bruce and the Battle of Bannockburn, uh, you, you know, like the Scottish War of Independence against the English. And um, what many people seem to forget or is not taught at school is that the Scots fancied themselves as liberating Ireland from the English, and they launched a campaign. Um, and so it was the Bruce's brother that was campaigning in Ireland. And um, and so the problem that the Irish had was that the Scots appeared to be liberators, but they weren't really um, any better, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, they, they, they came to be resented just, uh, ju ju just, just as quickly as as the English. So, so, so even back in like the 14th century, um, the uh, Ireland was being used um, as uh, as as this kind of um, experimental ground uh, by 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 the the kingdoms of of the British mainland, uh, you know. And and so then when you jump up to the 17th century. Um, the Scottish royal tradition is that, that they considered it their right then to um, I reclaim, in their eyes, reclaim uh, territories that uh, that had been held briefly by by, by uh, the kingdom of Sc kingdom of Scotland back in medieval times, and and so that that was their perception of of why um, they were justified in colonising uh, the north. Um, and and so, uh, uh, may I ask a brief question? I mean, yep. it, was, uh, it wasn't just Lowland Scots, as far as I recall. You also had people who were just Englishmen, uh, as well. Is that that's pretty much a separate element then? Right. Um. I I'm talking. Um. What, well, what what we're kind of doing right now is I'm jumping from before and then to after yes. crop, uh, and 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 so and so that um, entire what shall we call it travesty that <laughs> let's, let's call the uh, uh, the Cromwellian period that uh, that you know that's the that, that's a that's a devastation that's happening in the in the middle, um, you know so so what I'm talking about is, is is perhaps purely what the Scottish were thinking rather than what the English were up to at the same time or mm. or lapping it um and and yeah you know and and so that's why uh, the Scots so um or, or at least the Scottish nobility to be more accurate 
um, uh, you know, because there was a lot of cross-pollinization, shall we call it, um, between the Irish and the Scots uh, in, in, in terms of the, uh, like the plebs, uh, you, you know, uh, ra- rather than the, uh, uh, the, the nobility. Uh, so, and, 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 and so um, by the time that the, the royal Stuarts were um, also then uh, becoming the, the kings of England, I, they thought it was therefore natural. It was the natural thing to do to uh, uh, continue the colonization of Ireland. And so Ireland, what makes it different from like, like Scotland and England is Scotland and England were recognized royal kingdoms. Ireland was effectively the first colony. Hmm. Uh, uh, so, so, so you're talking about it being like a proto colony, a bit like a, a practice run, <laughs> you could say, for, for, for what, what was going to happen later in the British Empire. Um, obviously, from the English point of view, um, they had... Uh, well, well, again, you're going back to um, Edward I. Uh, and, you know, you know, so we're going back to, to medieval times. And, of course, he was the guy that was um, spreading himself around. Uh, and so it was effectively the presence in in Ireland of of his forces that the Scots were then uh, trying to quote unquote to liberate the Irish from. Um, and uh, but 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 obviously it, you know it was it was it was more of a selfish thing rather than uh, what can we do to help our our brothers in Ireland? You know it, it wasn't like that. You know, um, and and so yeah, so so that. That hopefully that kind of explains the demographic as to why there was therefore this concentration uh, in uh, the, the the Ulster regions um, as, uh, that were the uh, uh, the Ulster Scots, um, I, I, you know, which, which, which was then significantly different from um, the Catholic, uh, like like. That, that made up the bulk of of Ireland. You know, of, of, of obviously, natively speaking, that, that, that then you're talking Catholic. Um, now, I, I don't know how quite how disjointed the, the, this is coming across, but I'll I'll keep continuing and I'll and I'll rely on you interrupting me if if you're sort of yeah. Rude. So I'll, let me I'll briefly interrupt um, if that's okay. Yep. yep. So that's I, I you know may I understand history is pretty much along the same lines that effectively Ireland was the first uh, colony in. The, uh, the the first incursion in Ireland was an Anglo-Norman one in the 12th century, and then you know, Edward Edward was uh, active far somewhat later. Um, but uh, yeah, I think if that makes sense. So he Jabba was trying to align this idea of um, the Ulster Scots arriving primarily in in the 17th century with an earlier campaign to quote unquote liberate the the Irish, a campaign waged by the Scots allegedly to liberate them, uh, as as a kind of seen as a, I guess your point as a continue almost a birthright, or a continuation of a policy that should have been continued, or or or, or yeah, something along those lines. If so I'm just trying to make the audience understand if it if it had been destroyed, I don't think it was at least not for me, uh, what was going on. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, 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 yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's quite fun. It's one of these things that sometimes it's like, well, I've got the facts in my head, but it doesn't mean I'm, <laughs> the words are coming out in the right order, you know. So the but, the, um, the actual so the actual problems, which can pretty much stem do stem back to the 17th century, were were preceded by a alleged campaign of, liber- a campaign of liberation that has a sort of cultural and historical connection to the problems that would. Lead up to the present day problems is basically what he was saying. Anyway, uh, yes, yeah, As a, because I, I think it's important for people to also remember what was happening in Europe at the time, um, uh, uh, as as well. Uh, or, uh, uh, to clarify, uh, I'm talking 17th century. The wars uh, of religion, yes, uh, exactly. And so, what was happening in Ireland uh, was effectively part of the bigger picture of the wars of religion which which was um pitted catholic against protestant and um, and and so that's why um the events that were happening in ireland it, 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 so ireland is kind of like the 
the westernmost point, uh, you, you know, right on the fringe. But but what often happens when you've got fringes in society or in a civilization, you know, right on the edge, is the things that happen in the middle, the changes that happen in the middle, don't always cascade out right to the very fringe. And so what you've got is you've got the problems on uh, in, in mainland Europe were ultimately resolved. Uh, well, obviously, uh, 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 you know, you know, the, the, obviously there were, the, the, there were problems that uh, that were ongoing for 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 quite a while. There was a resolve, if I might. I, I think you, it's safe to say that they were resolved far earlier. So, the uh, Peace of Westphalia uh, during the Thirty Years' War, I mean, sixteen eighteen to sixteen forty eight. In some sense, I don't. I'm not saying it was. You know, all the conflict stopped. Uh, is almost symbolic and sort of bringing a lot of the wars of religion to a, a halt, relatively speaking. Whereas yeah, you have yeah. uh, continual problems in, in, in Britain and, uh, and Ireland. Uh, you know, you, you have, well, the Cromwellian uh, issues, you have the English Civil War, you have Bonnie Prince Charles, even later, you have all these things going on in Britain that are kind of related to events that happened earlier in the continent that were not entirely put to rest, but were more or less resolved, uh, and people had gotten over it, and it just continued for uh, quite some time, in, in basically. Yeah, yeah, because, because a, a lot of the things that were then fueled uh, in, 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 in like uh, Britain uh, were whether or not it would be a Protestant king or a Catholic king. So, so, the, so the Stuart family, uh, they were traditionally Catholic, you see, but they had a stronger claim to the throne. But of course, uh, since Henry VIII, um, <laughs> that, that all, 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 obviously um, the Reformation that, 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 well, as we've just been talking about, uh, you know, that swept right across Europe, um, then the actual majority of the people on, on mainland Britain uh, were, would, would prefer a Protestant king. Of course, in Ireland, they're seeing uh, the Scottish Catholic potential king as being well, that can be a savior. See, so 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 they are therefore um, that 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 was therefore a breeding ground to to, to actually get fighting men from uh, for for uh, the, the, the 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 sort of the Jacobite cause, and 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 so even although after there was relative peace in mainland Europe, because because there was this conflict between royal families in. Uh, Britain, then that was feeding into um, a continued turmoil in uh, Ireland. And of course, when you're actually talking about the actual uh, meeting together of uh, the armies, well, obviously there's the, like the, the Battle of the Boyne, uh, you know, which which the marches are are, are, are to celebrate. Um, then, then, then that was kind of like the big turning point. Yeah, you know, where, where that kind of guaranteed that uh, that the that the Protestants would continue to dominate uh, from 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 a British uh, uh, a power base, and um, and so that's kind of how the situation was left. Um, you, so you're basically talking about it just being a case of traditional case case of like landowners. Um, who were mostly based in England, uh, demanding rent off of the Irish who were actually living off of the the land, uh, and 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 so and so you've actually got um, a, apart from the atrocities that were happening during this time, uh, you, you know, like villages being burned, etc. Um, th uh, then. Was uh, was this was it was 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 this demand to 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 feed, feed the resources of of the landlords, and so that resentment, uh, and and abuse was 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 the cycle that just kept continuing, um, right up until a. Uh, well, well, I, I think you you know, we could say right up until the potato famine, then. Uh, mm. Things got even worse. <laughs> Probably should mention um, um, the Irish Act of Union. I suppose 18, 1801 might be off. I think it's eighteen oh one off the top of my head. That consolidated Ireland as as part of the um, the empire because you can't really. It's obvious that the conflict in Northern Ireland is intimately tied to 
to Ireland, the Republic, it's, well, the now Republic, but the island itself. And then much further down the line, 1921, uh, as the Irish uh, gain independence. And I mean, that effectively, that's really where the, the modern, modern conflict begins in Northern Ireland. Yeah, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's probably best if we, if we move into the 20th century now. Yeah, it's, it's a big. Um, well, I was say there, so you have this Act of Union in 1801, and I might be wrong about the date because I'm using my own, my working knowledge and, and memory. Um, and then in 1921, uh, the Ir Irish gain independence, but there's because of because of all the things we talked about um, and the non-Irish, non-Catholic background of so many of the people living in County Ulster or Northern Ireland, um, well, they're not really down with just but becoming part of the Republic, and that's kind of where a lot of these problems start. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, when we're talking about the uh, what what we should call, perhaps call the the troubles, you know, that's that, that's that's the word mm. made mainly for uh, the stuff that started after 1969. Um, the Events in the 1920s, I very much see that as being, although obviously linked, but separate to what happens in the later 20th century. And why I do that is because the, like the Easter uprising, you know, during World War One, you know, 1916, uh, and 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 then the um, 1919 to 1922 period. Um, these were what you could sympathetically say were nationalists fighting for the freedom of of their land. You, uh, you know, it's, it's a, they're, 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 they've got massive grievances which have been building up over centuries, and any sane person could understand why they would have resorted to to, to what they did. And it's a of it, of, of, obviously, anyone acting illegally is like no, nobody officially condones that. But at some point, um, somebody has to be a freedom fighter. And despite whatever side people may politically be on, objectively, you can look at that time period uh, in the 1920s and understand. You can at least understand that for them, they, they saw this as a life and death uh, fight for freedom. I said, no. What happened uh, post-1969, that is a different thing. You see, it's a, so what happens is you've got nationalism that was the traditional fighting for your land and your freedom that was in the 1920s. In 1969, the people that were actually calling themselves uh, Irish Republic. Oh, again, it's the not all, you, you know, the good old caveat, not all. Um, but um, there were significant members of uh, the Republican movement that it was not the cause of the freedom they were wanting. It w it's actually that there were militant Marxists wanting to set up their own Marxist system. Which obviously they, they therefore had to be um, a independent of the crown in order to do that, and so and so. Are what you even, indirectly referring to Sinn Fein here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just, um, just check it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, sorry, it's, um, um, and so what triggered this? You see, was obviously, obviously, the overriding cause is to reunite Ireland. And so the idea is reunite Ireland and then install a socialist system, right? But um, we are talking, they, they would have been, fan, what, what shall we say, fanboys of the Soviet system, uh, you know, you could almost say. Now, I'm aware that there will be listeners who will object strongly to that. I, I'm, I'm expressing my opinion here. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's undeniable that, that there were militant Marxists. Uh, that, that that became pr the provisional IRA, and um, and so what actually triggered everything in uh, 1969? Uh, it was actually unrest as a result of the Protestants 
being extremely violent against the Catholic communities. So even in like the 1960s, we're still talking about the Catholic community in Northern Ireland being suppressed, abused, and persecuted. So you're still talking about people with a justifiable grievance. Now, obviously, as 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 this conversation continues, you'll see that I, uh, but I did not uh, ever support um, paramilitary activity. Um, I, 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 you know, so I'm not, so I'm not saying this as some sort of build up. No, you're, you're saying that there were legitimate grievances felt on the side of the the Irish Catholics towards uh, the, the larger Protestant population um, prior to actual paramilitary act- activities. What you're saying, right? Uh, yes, yeah, you know, because it's, it's things like uh, because uh, you've you've got like the the shipyards of Northern Ireland were quite famous. You know, the Titanic was built there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, 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 you know, it's, um, I, but these jobs, I, so that so these were like relatively good paying jobs that to work in the shipyards. But if somebody went there to apply for a job and they had a Catholic name, they did not get the job. You see, so 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 there were there there was. And so they ended up having, like, the worst jobs uh, I, I, that, 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 that they could actually get that were poor-paying jobs. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's, it's like this is ge- genuine stuff to, be, to have a grievance about. Uh, you know, you know, you know and, and, and so then, um, like, the, the yard workers, you, you know, the yard managers would then, like, um, he would be a Protestant, and so he'd give the, uh, the jobs to any Protestants that came looking for work. Uh, you, you know, so as far as you know, so if, if we look at that through our twenty-first century eyes, that is incredibly disgusting thing, a uh, tactic to pull. You know, and and so that was then keeping the Catholic communities down because they were fairly impoverished as a result. Um, yeah, you know, so 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 like I'm saying, it's like um, it's fair to acknowledge genuine grievances that people had. Uh, but but now that I've said that, I'm, I'm now going to proceed. Um, uh, and um, and so what happened was the unrest, the violence was so bad, of course, that the British government sent in the army to, to, to actually get control of the streets. And so in 1969, the army was actually sent in to protect the Catholic community. And when that happened, the Catholic community initially were very appreciative and thankful and they were openly warm and welcoming to the British troops. That obviously was a problem for the activists who were wanting to reunite Ireland because they needed the community to hate the British and the British troops in order to try to push them back towards the campaign to to uh, unite Ireland and so that was actually the motivation of the setting up of the provisional IRA was actually because they could see that they were going to lose a hearts and minds war unless they could force the British army to 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 turn to, to become oppressors themselves and 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 so that's like the base motivation to actually to to, to actually then um, force um, incidents to happen. I now on the flip side, I'm not suddenly saying the British Army were sweet, innocent, uh, pure people here. <laughs> you, you, you know, it's, so, uh, we're talking real life. Real life, there's rarely actually good guys versus bad guys. Uh, sometimes everybody's a bad guy. They might start off with good intentions, but then there's mission creep, and then things start to happen. And then you try to minimize damage or try to achieve a quick victory, and you think, well, it's a nasty thing, but it's for the, it's for a good cause. Uh, you know, or, or whatever reason, because I'm not saying that all these people, like, you know, like, so whether we're talking paramilitaries, whether we're talking military personnel, I'm not saying these people are evil. I'm sure at the time they thought that they had a damn good cause and so therefore um, that... What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the phrase they use? 
Um, it, 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 it's that sort of haughty righteousness. Um, I can't remember the phrase, but um, but smug but, but, satisfaction, self content. Uh, yeah. it, it's this um, because you believe you're right, then you will suddenly be prepared to do all sorts of things. Well, yeah, there's a parallel, a vague parallel. So they, there are these, I forgot what they're called, there are these photos that surfaced a few years ago of uh, German NS officers outside of um, concentration camps who, they just, they're having a, a picnic, they're just sort of enjoying themselves. And whatever you think of the details, I mean, something went wrong in the concentration camps. There's sort of, that they're sort of, they're content. They don't seem disturbed at all, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I, I, you know, so, so again, I'm, I'm keen. Like, like I'm saying, I'm kind of keen to stress uh, the humanity that um, these are still real people. Well, I think As, everyone. This is the problem, is it not? In all kinds of uh, re religious, ethnic, social conflict, that bo both sides are human, and they may even have, in a in a in an objective sense, legitimate grievances. Um, but each side views the other side as uh, well, unworthy of, of the attention it's getting or it, or reconciliation. And, and so as an outsider, uh, it's very, I think it's an important thing. And what you're doing is to, yeah, say that you know, they're both human beings here, but uh, they have different views. Yeah, and it's... And also, it was it was also so polarized because um, we're not talking about something that you could actually, despite uh, despite the the Good Friday Agreement that subsequently happened in the 1990s, that um, which was uh, they attempted to thwart that too, if I recall. I think it was the worst incident in decades mm, after that but, one. But um, they. You know, despite the fact that there's the Good Friday Agreement in existence, um, the actual positions are two sides of a coin. I, I you know, you know, it's, it's it's one or the other. Um, there is no proper compromise, which is why, to coin a phrase, um, the Good Friday Agreement's a cluster f, um, shall we say? <laughs> you, you can say cluster fuck. It's no problem. Yes, um, I must admit, I do normally swear a lot more than I do here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, swear as much as you want there. Oh, oh no! You know prohibitions on your speech or speech mannerisms, as long as you <laughs> speak in a coherent fashion that is not in line with the current generation. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Sorry, I realize I've talked over half of what you're saying there, but um, uh, I'm civilized, honest. Uh, yeah, it's uh, um, okay. Um, uh, okay, uh, it's maybe best if I, if, I, if I move it along a little bit rather than laboring the point too much. Uh, you know, because um. Um, because now I suppose we we start to move on a little bit to some of the not so nice things that people started doing to each other. Well, bloody I think Bloody Sunday might be a good point. I mean, although I, I do, I mean, let's I don't know how important you view this to be, but around around this time, you know, 1969, or, or just just after that, it seems to me that most of the political, uh, like the D, uh, DUP, the D, uh, Democratic Unionist Party. Sinn Féin, um, the uh, Social Democratic and Labour part, like a lot of these parties emerged approximately in, in 1970, 71, around the same date, and that probably isn't a coincidence. Oh no! Um, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> um, yeah, uh, because the other thing uh, you have to remember about uh, the late 1960s. Uh, I, I, again, it's when you look at the sort of st stand back and look at the big picture, um, because it, sometimes it's easy to to just simply be looking at. So, what was happening in Belfast at the time? Is uh, yeah, you know, it's it's like well, remember that there was the the human rights marches in, in the United States, and um, and so that was actually igniting people uh, ac ac across the across the world. Really? So you're saying that the civil rights movement had a sort of amplifying effect on what was going on in Northern Ireland? Well, well, you see, because so, so you you then had your um, that the, the, there were civil rights rallies uh, that that, uh, that were that were being organised in in Ireland, and, well, specifically uh, Ulster, Northern Ireland, 
Uh, and, and because this was to highlight the plight of the Catholic community, who were not getting equal treatment uh, to to the Protestant community, and of course the um, the governors, uh, you know, the the uh, the British government were just turning a complete blind eye to this, because as long as the trouble was internal, they just considered that a domestic matter, so to speak. Uh, you know, it's a it's, it's a bit like um. If people don't interfere with uh, arguing couples, then the British government tried their best to kind of wash their hands of it. And then when the violence got too bad, then they had to send in the troops. But but yes, there, there, uh, there, there were um, ca- uh, campaigners for civil rights, uh, which were directly inspired by uh, the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, now, this was then... There were efforts to try to hijack the civil rights movement then to turn it into an Irish nationalist movement. And because uh, the people who, who, who were actually had the grievance were Catholics, then it was very easy to, to then start to um, make it look, well, at least make it look that way. I, 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 you know, it's, um, uh, because, because then you would have Irish nationalists actually trying to become um more of the vocal activists to uh, um, uh, uh, you know within, within the civil rights movement and so then you start having problems of um, that's getting the backs up of the Protestant community and also alerting the British in terms of from an intelligence point of view um, and uh, although that's not something that that I can't really go into more detail there. That, that's not really something that I, uh, that I know about. Uh, it's uh, you know it's it is more a case of yet yeah, yeah, yes it happened and and so there's a bit of a a blurred sequence of events that I can't really elucidate. Um, where this kind of helped to uh, further the influence of of the Irish Republicans. Uh, you, you know, be, be, because it, because it wasn't just a simple case of um, uh, the British went and they, start, they started kicking doors down, and and then everyone supported the 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 the, pro, the provost, you know, the provisional IRA. You know, it it didn't well, work. Certainly, if I might interrupt briefly, uh, Bloody Sunday in 1972. You know, the I mean, it's kind of been commercialized, I guess you can say, but it, it was an important uh, event as far as I understand. Um, invigorating and inflaming um, Irish uh, Irish Republican nationalism. No, no, um, because leading up to that, well, you could say that um, in the late sixties, leading up to nineteen sixty nine, there, there was an internal argument within the Irish uh, nationalist movement, and so there was actually, you could say that the 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 activists were split. You know. Um, I, I, I think I'll, I'll just put a quick aside in here. Um, I, I'm, I'm referring to activists because most of the civilian population did not want anything to do with it. You see, see this. Um, another popular misconception is that the entire population were kind of like on the streets, kind of thing, and 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 fully behind everything that was happening on their side. And it, it wasn't like that at all. Um, and and so and so you've got like activists, and that it's a bit like you 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 could imagine it a bit like a like a, like a sort of archery target. You know you know it's like you've 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 got your paramilitaries in the middle, you've got your activists in a ring outside them, you've got the sympathisers a ring outside them, uh, but the big ring on the outside that's got most people in it are the people that just wanted a normal life. Mm-hmm. I, 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 you, know, you know there's these increments of of involvement. I, you know, so so not everybody was um, it was was was, was die hard, and um, and so there was a schism uh, within with, within the Irish nationalist movement because a lot of the activists were feeling that actually taking up arms again, uh, you, you know, they're sort of going, it's not you know, it's not the twenty anymore, um, it's it's a bad idea to to take up arms again, and um, and you could say. Again, I do stress this is my opinion. Um, I, I, I've, I've got reasons for for, for my opinion, but I, but I, it would take too long, and it's too much of a tangent, I think, to actually go into why. Uh, but basically, 
what we, what we would call the traditional nationalists uh, did not want to bear arms uh, against the, the, the British army. The militant Marxists did. And so there was actually a split. The militant Marxists then proceeded to, to, to actually bear arms and, uh, and, and, and start a terrorist campaign. Um, and, and, and so even to this day, uh, it, there, it's not a unified um, group of people. As a, as a, a, you know, they, they're, they're, there's a whole swathe of people who are activists who want to do things legally. Uh, but then you've got the other half who are going, fuck it, kill a Brit. <laughs> you know, you know as, as a, and, um, and, 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 and so there was that schism right from the start of the modern troubles. Uh, so, you know, so there's plenty of people that they would maybe even openly say they hate the British. But it's not that they were going to actually take a gun to them. Mm. I, I, you know, it's a, and um, but I think I may be labouring this point a little bit too much. Uh, as as I'll, I'll 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 progress a little bit. Um. So yeah. Um. Bloody Sunday. Oh good grief! Hang on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That was. Nineteen seventy-two. That may have been a civil rights march to begin with, actually. It was. They were, as I recall, they were basically uh, peaceful protesters. Uh, they were processing the internment policy that had developed. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know what happened afterwards. The uh, For whatever reason, the uh, the English or British soldiers opened fire. 14 total deaths and a bunch of injuries. Yeah. And, huh? Um I have heard accounts. Uh, what what shall we say? That are both in favour of and against the official story. Um, hmm. Now, again, this is like one incident. Um, whether the official story is accurate or not, um, it didn't change the fact that this rat made, it was a catastrophic deterioration. Of events after that, hmm. uh, I, I, you know, you know, so, so, so whether um, the the soldiers were triggered into firing, um, or you know, or or whether, it, but, they, but I'm I'm sort of skipping around something here, aren't I? Right. Um, I heard a credible story that um, that see there was a technique that uh, that the, the provisionals would do. Um, to actually try to, what shall we say, trick uh, British soldiers into shooting civilians. Um, and what they'd do is, if there was a crowd, they would um, show a firearm and then walk into the crowd. And um, I have heard... Well, Martin McGuinness is now dead, so I'll, so, so, so I'll make reference to him. Martin McGuinness was supposed to be one of the guys on Bloody Sunday that that uh, that, that was doing this. Where step out of the crowd, show, show a weapon, and then disappear into it. Then somebody else would step out, disappear into it, and then they would circulate. And uh, the, 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 the idea is, is that the, the soldiers would then pan, like start panic shooting. Because because they're thinking it's it, it, they're thinking it's it's an armed mob, hmm. uh, and um, I, I have zero evidence for that. But I have heard it from fr- from people that that I would call credible. Um, now that having been said, I uh, maybe that's someone who just doesn't want I. Uh, the Catholics to have <laughs> to, uh, 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 to 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 to, to have. Um, uh, an atrocity against them. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's um, it, it can sound credible, but but that doesn't actually mean it's necessarily true. Um, there's a, an awful lot of people in 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 the Irish Troubles who can convince the ass off of anybody, and yet they're lying through their teeth. It's um, it's uh, well, Troubles is an understatement, yeah, <laughs> on more than one level. But uh, okay, right. Um, but but the long and short of it is, so so there's potentially that happening, or 
maybe that's maybe maybe the movie's true. Maybe none of that was happening at all. Maybe, may, may, you know, there was, there were. It's fairly clear that somebody got spooked, uh, fired a weapon, and then that panicked uh, the troops. Uh, it's a uh, one thing I can say with fair certainty. It was see, it wasn't like the Amritsar massacre or something like that, where the officer told them to fire on the crowd. <laughs> you, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's it, that's not uh, the sequence of events. Um, now, you could say there was a breakdown of communication. It's possible that there was. Um, well, I, I think ultimately, if I might interrupt, that as we want to proceed, um, the exact details, perhaps no one can engrave upon them entirely, but we can talk about the consequences, and there's greater clarity there. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. A, well, well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think whatever people's opinions are, all. all who was to blame? It doesn't change what happened next, and um, and so everything went from zero to a thousand overnight. Um, that okay, right? What what I will perhaps add? Um, I've got another reason to think I. That the British Army felt, or, or, or should I say, British intelligence felt that they had been duped in, into uh, that c c c committing that massacre, um, is because I pretty much immediately after that they set up uh, specialist units, um, specialist army units um, that were not under. Army command that were directly under intelligence command, um, and of course the, 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 they did not admit to them for years. Um, people may have heard of the MRF, um, the the Mobile Reconnaissance Force, and well, again, this is if if it had been declared a war zone, then this would have been a war crime. Um, what they you see because what they were doing was they were dressed as civilians they were trying to start they were specifically trying to encourage the sectarian war they you see they were actually specifically trying to encourage the sectarian war and like i say there there's no good guys in the story <laughs> you know yeah. and what they would do is dress as civilians they were driving to a neighborhood and shoot people, random people, civilians, so that they would assume the other side had done it. And um, and so they would go into a, like a Protestant area and shoot up a, bu a bus shelter or something like that, and they were using weapons that were known to be Weapons of choice of the of the IRA, for instance, uh, and then vice versa. They would then drive into um, a Catholic area and shoot pe shoot some people up, or, or 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 just simply execute somebody in the street and leave them there. And of course, they would assume that the the loyalists, uh, the, the Protestants, had done it, and. Um, because what the the theory they had behind this was that it would be easier to find who the terrorists are if they are actively running around the streets uh, with their weapons, and it's it's absolutely that's a, obviously that's a simplification, but but it was the most insane idea ever conceived. Um, it actually got rumbled. I actually got rumbled, and they had to disband the unit. But uh, but nobody was prosecuted because these are special forces. Nobody knows their names. Um, there, there's there, there's a Home Office Section D notice, uh, as 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 what uh, we would call it these days, um, which is basically a blanket ban on any coverage anywhere. Um, and you know, so, so if, for instance, a journalist was to get the story, um, they they're also aware 
that um, there's a section D notice, which is which is basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but but it's effectively telling people if if you breathe a word of this, you're committing treason. Uh, you know, you know, it's in the interest of national security, you cannot report this. Okay, so let's move on uh, as we proceed down the the, the historical line. Whatever, once again, whatever actually happened at the time, uh, it had an impact, right? And it doesn't change the impact of the things that happened. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a, well, that's the thing. Uh, there, there's, there's, there's the knock-on. Um, there, obviously, um, the paramilitaries on both sides uh, were also uh, committing sectarian violence. Then, uh, beating up each other, killing each other. Um, and uh, oh, oh well, that's the thing. Oh, you, you know, you know, there's 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 the um, that wall. You know, like put, erecting walls to separate the communities, um, and uh, and 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 so and so each of these communities would uh, effectively be self-contained. You know, it's like there were, the, you know, it's like a, a Protestant just simply would not risk walking into a Catholic area, and vice versa. You know, it's um, there were. You know, then again on both sides, for instance, uh, you know, so before the trouble started, there's maybe a, a family, um, one parent is Catholic, one parent's Protestant. Um, they'd they, they'd get it from both sides, um, because because they dared to marry the other side. Yeah, you know, even though the marriage was like years before the the troubles had started. Hmm. And, and and you know you know and they had like teenage kids or something, yeah. uh, you, you know it's like that didn't matter. Burn their house down. <laughs> you, you know it's 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 extraordinary that that, that this is happening in uh, a part of the United Kingdom in the middle of the twentieth century. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It, it seems that uh, at least in Western Europe, uh, most of Western Europe, Northwestern Europe, that this is just. A co- complete anomaly in, in terms of the degree of violence, activity, hatred. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's quite strange. It's it's bizarre, actually. Yeah, well, well, that's the thing. And and when we're talking about sectarianism, um, logic does not is not part of the equation. It's it's a case of like it's pure tribal hatred of the other side, and of course because of the history. Um, of, of of the wars of religion, the the defining factor then was: were you Catholic or were you Protestant? Are you a friend or do I try to kill you? I said, and 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 so, in theory, each side were trying to target the paramilitaries on each side, but if they couldn't find anybody, they wanted the bloodlust. So regularly, you'd have normal civilians. Nothing to do with anything. You know that group of people that just want a normal life? Hmm. Suddenly, they're killed in the street. And so, it doesn't take long before whoever started it, it kind of stops mattering because so many innocent people uh, have died on both sides that now both sides just cannot back down because everybody's now got a, a genuine grievance of some sort and uh, and and so now both sides have got grievances the majority of the population on both sides just want a normal life and yet the 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 hurt the misery and the violence was was was, was uh, increasing all the time as um you, you know it's, it's like the, the 1970s um I'll not actually I'll actually avoid uh, mentioning specific names, places, and that for 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 some of the. But I, what I can confirm, no, when I say I can confirm this, this is actually knowledge that if people were looking into this stuff, uh, they can find it from publicly available sources. Uh, you know, so so it's not as if it's like oh the big reveal. Uh, you, you know, you know it's, um, but um, so so the MRF, um. You know, the Mobile Reconnaissance Force. They were disbanded, uh, but the people who were running it, the inter- intelligence, um, they disbanded that. But 
the very next week, they set up a new unit. And it was a case of, well, we can't actually be going around killing people, but um, but they need to actually... They, how right? Hang on, let me backtrack just just slightly. In other words, let me start the sentence again. <laughs> right, um, you could say that the MRF, the idea behind that was defeat the enemy by any means necessary. Now, the replacement was defeat the enemy by any means necessary. That ga- but we've got to guarantee that it's not something that the public will ever know about. Uh, now, these are also uh, the same in, um, intelligence teams that would then be infiltrating paramilitary groups. Uh, it, it, well, more successfully in the future, but, but, but then that's how things came to head in the 1990s. Right. Uh, I, I do have a question during all of this. Um, the normal people, one could assume made up the majority, particularly the Irish Catholics, was there no, I mean, to my knowledge, there was some uh, immigration from Northern Ireland to the Republic. Uh, was this a, a prominent phenomenon, would you say, that the Irish Catholics, the normal ones, just got fed up with it and just left? Oh, uh, good question. I'm, I I wouldn't really be able to give an informed opinion on that. I, I could say that there's... um. There were strong family links uh, between North and South on, on, on the Catholic side because, um, well, as far as they're concerned, it's um, community's community. I, I, you know, it's like because somebody drew a border on the map, hmm. uh, you, you know, it's like um, if it's cutting somebody's farm in half, then it's, it's still their farm on both sides of the border, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, they'll have friends and family on both sides of the border. Um, now, as, as, as far as people um, getting out of the area, I, I, well, I'm, I'm aware of that happening, but at the same time, I I wouldn't have called it a, like a noticeable evacuation, uh, so to speak. Um, what? I'll, I'll, I'll if I continue on a slight tangent to that, really. Uh, but you know, because again, it's it's the, the the normal people's attitude towards the paramilitaries. Uh, I, I, I you know I, I think it's it, it, it's perhaps worth mentioning at this point. Um, now it became very quick to for people to understand that anybody who is a friend of someone who is known to be a paramilitary, you know, again, on both sides I'm talking here, um, could become a target. And that included the, uh, the place of employment. So, so that people, uh, shops, factories, they did not want paramilitaries working there because they didn't want a bomb blowing up the front window. And so, paramilitaries that people who who were known to be paramilitaries then could not actually get normal work, and so um, they supplement didn't supplement their income. They they made their income from criminal activities, just normal gangster stuff, right? And um, and so what what effectively happened was. These paramilitaries turned into criminal gangs because they they couldn't get uh, money via other means. And what that meant was, apart from doing things like robbing banks and that kind of thing, I uh, was an extortion racket uh, with their own neighbours, uh, like their own neighbourhoods. It's like what so what you would have is paramilitaries. You know, so I'm talking. Protestants going to Protestants, Catholics going to Catholics. So this is something that's happening internally at the same time as the war uh, uh, between both sides. Uh, you know, so there's the sectarian thing happening, but um, both paramilitary uh, sides are wanting to raise funds to feed to, to to feed themselves and their families, also to buy weapons. Um, uh, you know, because because these were not actually being handed to them for free. They had to, you know, you had to buy the stuff on the black market. Um, 
And so, and so they would uh, start up protection rackets, uh, telling shop owners like um, that their own, what, what people traditionally consider their own side, would blow up their shop if they, if they didn't pay protection money. You know, you know, and and it's like, and so there was actually an amazing amount of resentment within their own communities for them. It was terror. It's like. And I use that word advisedly. It's like you know, it's like they're not called terrorists for nothing. In in terms of it, wasn't just a case of fear of being killed by getting blown up by a bomb. It was inflicting terror on their own communities by threatening to to like hurt them, hurt their kids, or blow up their premises if they didn't cough up the money. How how long? I mean, how long does this go on? And what's the approximate timeline for this internal terrorism? Would you say? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I, the, when that started. I, I, if, I, if, if, I, if I was to put a guesstimate on it, I, 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 would, I would say that was probably in operation mid 1970s at a guess, because because it's the, the the bombings that got really heavy after Bloody Sunday. You know, and, you know, so 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 the years after that. Um, you know, so like seventy-two to like say seventy-seven, I, I, the bombing campaigns. I, yeah, you know, I, I, I would say it's like you're. That was really the start of the bombing campaigns, and 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 and, and the place turned into a war zone, like actually like, like rubble in the streets, from 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 <laughs> destroyed buildings and all sorts, um, and. Um, and as far as the extortion rackets go, uh, that's still happening today. Even in 2017? Yes. But I, I mean, it, violence, overt violence has died down quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Um, the other thing that happens is people want to talk about how successful the Good Friday Agreement is. So that's the official media narrative. I mean, I think there's a, the audience is probably not too. So let's go over what the Good Friday Agreement was. I, th I think that's important because we're. I know what it is, and you know what it is. So let's, yeah, maybe for the sake of the audience, what was the Good Friday Agreement? Okay. Um, sorry about the silence. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Okay. Well, I, I can explain. I can explain it. So if if you. Uh, well, well, what what I can perhaps say is, by the 1990s, uh, the paramilitary groups uh, had been infiltrated by British intelligence, and so the game was up really for them. Um, at the same time, uh, the politicians were trying to work out a way. To stop this from happening generation on generation, and so the idea that the politicians had uh, was, well, let's actually come to the negotiating table and see if we can thrash out a deal. That, see, the idea was that if if there's a peace agreement, even if you disagree uh, with everything about about the people that that you're arranging the agreement with. The idea was to try to stop it from continuing on to future generations. And so, as much as I hate the politicians as well, <laughs> um, I understand their logic. Um, and so, the whole point was, there was a lot of um, fury in the intelligence community because the paramilitaries were effectively a busted flush. And yet the politicians then started showering um, these uh, paramilitary sides, or should we say um, their political um, political representatives. Uh, you know, like, like Sinn Féin, for instance, uh, uh, or, 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 or like the, uh, the the UDA or something like that, you know, the Ulster Defence Association. Um, 
there and so the militarily uh, they were right on the point of where they could have been wiped out at any time they were that beaten now, no, don't get me wrong that doesn't mean that they were uh, so they were still dangerous and they could you know, still capable of pulling things off but all it needed was the order to be given and they could have effectively been completely wiped out now I'm talking about um, again both sides uh, you know we're talking um, well no hang on let's let, let's let's actually that, that I think that's enough down that rabbit hole for the time being mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah so 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 basically um, the the intelligence community was furious with the government but also at the same time they were also helping to set up the ne negotiations. So the, there was a ceasefire. So there managed to, so there managed to be a, a ceasefire negotiated 1995, I think it was, and then it was 1998. Oh, God, grief, I'm, I'm forgetting my 19, date. Sorry, the Good Friday Agreement, as far as I remember, is 1998. Yeah, and, and, and so the, uh, you know, the Good Friday Agreement is kind of like formalizing it um, with a view to um, putting down the guns, uh, you know, like picking up the ballot box is, is, is kind of the, I believe. Uh, you know, so, so, um, so if you've got a grievance, use the political system, you know, like, like don't go out and, and, and try to kill each other, basically. Um, and from a British perspective, it has by and large worked. And what I mean by that is because there's no Irish violence on the British mainland. And so from that point of view, it worked. Um, no, there's still, you know, there's, there's still groups even this day that's to activate cells. I, I, you know, so so it's it's not as if it's like, oh, that's fine, game over, and next, <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's um, there's there's always, uh, there's always going to be a concern, um, because the thing is, um, if and for argument's sake, let's say Northern Ireland, I uh, did unite with 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 the uh, the Republic of Ireland, then the Protestants would flare up. Uh, so there's always going to be somebody who's going to have a grievance about what happens next. Because there's been such crap happened, A, in, in the last half of the, the 20th century is bad enough. You, you know, then that, that's before you even take a history lesson and look back what's happened over centuries. Uh, you, you know, so, so now it's all blurred into where everybody's got a grievance uh, and everybody's got a genuine cre grievance or, to some extent or another. And so whatever people decide, there's always going to be somebody wanting to make their mark on history because they're... Well, how will we des describe it? Um, there, I suppose there's a certain stereotype of Irish people um, holding grudges and taking revenge. And stereotypes are there for a reason. Uh, basically, because the people, like I'm saying, you've got the majority of, 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 of the population, absolutely lovely people, but the very people who are the ones that hold a grievance and take revenge, they're the ones that are the agitators in the first place. You know, so, so, so they're the ones uh, leading the charge to say, let's start planting bombs again. <laughs> so you think that fundamentally because of the long history, there is no, I guess for lack of a better way of describing it, permanent solution uh, to these problems, the you know the Good Friday Agreement, and all these other attempts at reconciliation notwithstanding. I, I don't think there'll ever be proper peace as the rest of Western civilization imagines peace to be. 
Well, actually, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll object to <laughs> theory, I'm, I'm theory crafting here, so we'll talk about that a bit maybe later. Uh, if there's a Muslim takeover of Europe, maybe, <laughs> just maybe, the Unionists and the, the Irish Catholics can uh, get together and, and fight them off, maybe. And after they fought them off, they'll go back to killing each other and not liking each other. But still, it would be a, a brief respite in, in, okay. in between. That is something hold and raise it later. Yeah. That... yeah. I think we've cut, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, as the audience can probably tell, not a happy story. Um, and I think, uh, well, I've actually never been to Northern Ireland. I've been extensively in Ireland. and It's a place I'd like to visit uh, at some point in time. But it, you, know, you can definitely hear the tragedy uh, that that is there, and uh, sort of, it's the same sense as uh, like as I'd like to move on to Scotland. That I, a general sense I get in Ireland that I've had in Scotland when I've been there. These are uh, places with a tragic past and a past that, in some sense, has not been entirely reconciled with the present, and that actually makes these places special. I think in a way that, for example. If you go to Scotland, in particular the Highlands, apart from the landscape, which I think one can appreciate on its own merits, uh, you get that that feeling of, of tragedy in the air, that something lost that I'm thinking right now, in particular of the, of the Highland clearances, but that you didn't really have in, in, in England. It's a very different feeling. And I admit that's a bit of a kind of metaphysical description. I'm not really known for that, but... Uh, Let's talk about Scotland, since uh, you're pretty familiar with that part of the world as well. Um, is, is it okay if I, if, I, if I just say one last thing? Sure, of course, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. It was, it was just to round off uh, about the unresolvability, or you know, or, or, or true peace in, in Ireland. Um, I think what people are compromising on is that things were so bad in the the 1970s especially um, that they're prepared to put up with what is currently happening you know because there's, there's punishment beatings kneecappings you know like pe- you know people occasionally getting shot stuff like that uh, you know that like that's all still happening but things were so bad before that they're prepared to accept life like that now because they don't want it to go back to how bad it actually was before. Mm. And so it's if you're talking about comparing it to how, how it was before, then now is peace. But right. but 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 for, for people that uh that are used to like living in suburbs and and just uh Going to the cinema at the weekends without security checking, then that, then it's a concept that um, they I would imagine they would think it's it's still hell on earth. But but that's it, 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 but but anyway, yes, yeah, yeah, it was it was just um, it, it was just my opinion on why people call it um, call it peace, but 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 it's not really peace. It's, you know, it's just because for the people that are actually living it, it's still better than than, than what they've just come out of. But uh, yeah, Scotland. Okay, Scotland. <laughs> no, I just it, you know time constraints and the attention of the audience. I mean, it, one could obviously write a PhD uh, dissertation on the issues uh, that have afflicted Northern Ireland. But I think we got a really uh, detailed and, and nice picture of what's going on. And I, uh, thank you for that. Scotland, yeah, Scotland, of course, has a a different history. Um, I don't. It's it's difficult. To, oh, I mean, I've talked about Scotland before, but it's difficult to know where where to start. Do we start from the Act of Union? Do we start from you know Robert uh, Bruce? Do we start? You know, right. That's um, the thing. Well, at least you never said start at John O'Groats because I'm going to say that's going to be a long. <laughs> O'Groats, right? I, I've I've said this before. I've actually visited John O'Groats. I was only there for the sake of curiosity. In yeah. The northernmost town in in continental Scotland, as it were, or, or yeah, you know what I mean. Not not the Orkneys, yeah. not Shetlands, but I was yeah, there. Yeah. The problem Physically is you get, there. you get there and it's like, but there's nothing here. 
Like, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. I got there and I was looking around. This is, I think, in the in the early two thousands, late nineties. I was just looking around and there was nothing there. But I I've been to John O'Groats. So <laughs> took my hat off to myself. Um, okay. okay, right. Um, now Scotland. Um, are, are we talking like like like? The build-up of the of the political makeup, or or are we just yeah, I mean, I guess I'm most interested in in Scotland today. Obviously, the Scotland does have that tragedy too. There were the Highland clearances. There were, I mean, there were the Jacobite problem I and mean, all these things, and that's a lot of history. But yeah, yeah, it's a, well, I, su- I suppose that's the um, again, that's the the knock-on effect of. Oh, 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 oh uh, yeah, uh, that might be a good starting point, actually, is uh, there's the sectarianism in Scotland um, is what you could say uh, Ireland's little brother. Uh, yeah, you know, so, so, so you've got uh, Catholics and Protestants hating each other. The main difference being is they would maybe like beat each other up, but they, w- but they wouldn't actually kill each other. And the the over, over the the past decades, like we could say, probably starting in the late eighties, early nineties, the government decided that they had to actually try to do something about it because they were worried it was actually getting, uh, you know, that it was going to be getting worse. It's like um, it was usually manifest in whether you were a Rangers supporter or a Celtic supporter, and <laughs> this was happening towns you know you know although they were like the, the the sort of like the uh the protestant and catholic football teams of glasgow um this was still happening in towns well outside glasgow as well i, I you know so so it's it's not as if it's just a glasgow problem but but that's sometimes how it's painted but um um and and so yeah uh you would get um people who would you'd have people who had no connection or or, uh, or no direct connection with Ireland, should I say? I, you know, because historically, if if you're talking about um, tra- like, like tracing the history of of like the Scots nation or something, you know, you know then obviously there's there, there's um, a, um it's joined at the hip with Ireland, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, so you've got people who, as far as their hit lifetime history is concerned, got got nothing to do with that. Um, uh, they'll they'll get history at school, and their parents, because uh, a lot of this is passed through families, where it's a bit like parents then indoctrinate their kids to um, hate Catholics or to hate Protestants or to hate the English, um, and so it's, it, it wasn't necessarily um, something that was officially happening at school. But it was something that was actually consistently happening from generation to generation. Um, so, so even in Scotland, you would you, you would have uh, communities um, that were uh, relatively separate, uh, and you know, you know, so so you'd have like a uh, mostly Catholics and maybe like one council estate, and mostly Protestants and 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 a, a nearby council estate, uh, you know, and and. Um, and, and 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 so all that stuff was um, with people who themselves did not actually have a grievance, but it was tradition to keep the grievance alive. And so you could be talking Catholics with a grievance about the Highland clearances, um, but but obviously that's them. Taking a, a grievance from like two hundred odd y- years ago, <laughs> actually, to actually justify their sectarian um, uh, hatred of t- of twentieth century. And so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to uh, justify. Or it would be because there really there's no comparison in, in, in Scotland to the type of sectarianism that. Was shot through Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, this is different. This is this this is people who were using it as an excuse yeah. for. A, um, it, it it was how they defined how, how who to have in their gang, 
and and who was the enemy. Uh, so, yeah, and 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 so it was. Um, I would describe it as this. This may this is maybe going to sound a bit weird uh, because I'm talking about the attitudes here rather than necessarily the actions. But um, the sectarianism in Scotland, I would describe as perhaps being more vicious than actually the sectarianism in Ireland. And that sounds weird because in Ireland people are actually blowing each other up. But um, but what you had happening in Scotland was it would be a breeding ground for people who would then they would support their football team and then nip over to Ireland to, what shall we say, quote-unquote, help out, then nip back over again and um, either back, back, back in time to, to go to work or, uh, or off for the next football match. And so how you had people in Northern Ireland who were known paramilitaries who couldn't get a job, then you had Scotsmen who could have a job because nobody in Scotland knew who the, knew, knew that they were up to up to no good, and they, they could they could get the ferry across to um, uh, to Larne or or um, uh, uh, well to, to Northern Ireland, uh, and um, and 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 so you had this, this sort of like casual um, casual warrior you could say, and and then that would also be taken to the to the football terraces, for instance, uh, you know, so, so there's a bit of a history of bad football hooliganism with with like the old firm matches. The old firm is when Rangers and Celtic sort of met up, you know, for the like the derby match, so to speak. Do you think um, the sort of the modern incarnation of of hatred or dislike towards the English is is just almost like artificial larping, ju- just because? Of things like Brexit and, and and recent occurrences, or do you think that there's some people who, to this day, feel uh, a legitimate sense of dispossession uh, because maybe their ancestors, or, or or at least just in terms of perception, they were wronged in history by the English? Yeah, it's um, the hatred is real, but the reason is false. Um. And so it's, it, it is basically the result of brainwashing from right people right from when they're toddlers. It's a bit like the Scottish tradition is remember to always hate the English. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's said as a joke a lot of the time by a lot of people, but then there's just as many people who they've got this resentment. Hmm. Um, Which you feel is unjustified. I do now. Um, I I was when I was growing up, um, it was very easy to to fall in line with it. So it um, took a lot of it. Basically, took the passage to adulthood and and self reflection to realize that it was it was unjustified. Yeah. Also, also leaving Scotland um, and discovering that English people are actually normal too. <laughs> Shocking. Yeah. Oh no, no! I'm not saying you're not allowed to laugh, but but you know what I mean. I'm saying no kidding. It's, it's like it, it was as literal as that. It was like, because because the thing that would happen is uh, people would say things like, "Yeah, you can always spot an Englishman. Look, at fucking wanker walking down the street. Look at that wanker there. I bet he's English and turns that he was English, right? You know, you know, stuff like that would would would, would be the constant dialogue in the street. Um, and um, and then when I was actually down in England, I was um, I suddenly realised. The difference in the population size, and I'm I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, there's this there's this like large large town in England, you know, like part of Greater London, um, and uh, I, you know, and I, and I was and I was there visiting somebody, and and I was standing there in the street, you know, you know, like uh, out, outside the shopping mall, kind of thing, you know, the shopping centre, and I suddenly realised that. Um, I was identifying, oh yeah, look at that, that's a wanker, look at that, that's a wanker. And then I suddenly realised that what I'm doing is I'm identifying the people and ignoring the majority of the other people who looked perfectly normal, who was walking past me. And then when I went home, I was actually look, looked in my own hometown, you know, much smaller population, and then I realised that per capita, 
there's exactly the same number of wankers in Scotland. <laughs> that are, it's just that you don't spot them as often because there's a lot less people. And 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 that was kind of like my road to Damascus moment. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, you know that. Um, uh, and that's actually, I think that was when I started looking at history for myself rather than just uh, accepting what the teachers were telling me at school. Um, the teachers yeah, te- were engaging in a brainwashing propaganda, uh, a curriculum as well? I, I, yes, I, what I, I, I have to go anecdotal here, I'm afraid. It's not that I've got research about the official, um, uh, the, 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 the official curriculum. All I can confirm is that the, the schools that I went to, that's what happened. Um, and based on the widespread attitude that everybody else had, I'm kind of drawing a conclusion that that seemed to be widespread. Um, now, to give you an example, you know, so talk about like the Jacobite uh, uprising, for instance. Mm. So um, they would tell us that um, that was the Scottish versus the English, and so everything was. I'll just withdraw once again. I'll start. I'll start. I'll, I'll start my sentence again. It's probably. It's probably a bit better if I just go back just a little bit. Uh, you, you know. Um, so you've got um, like thirteen, fourteen. You know the Battle of Bannockburn. Uh, you know. You know. Uh, thirteen twenty. Scotland declares independence uh, of England. That was the Scots versus the English. Now, you bring it forward to, um, like, 1715, 1745, you know, so battle. Scots versus the Highlanders. That's what you're getting at, right? It's, um, well, you see, what they were doing, they were, they, were, they were not wanting to spread sectarianism in the school. So rather than saying it was Catholics versus Protestants, they said it was Scots versus English. No, oh, okay. There were actually more Scotsmen in what we were told was the English army than were in what we were told was the Scottish army at, at, at the Battle of Culloden. Hmm. Right? So, um, and um, there was French and Irish uh, in the quote-unquote Scottish army. As, <laughs> you know, it's a, um, it, was, it was a sectarian battle. It was, you know, it was, it was all about whether it was a, a Catholic king or a Protestant king. And but, but, but what we were taught at school is basically how those bastard English shafted the Scots and they slaughtered these poor Highlanders. And so anything that was Catholic, we were told was Scottish. Um, and uh, you know, when you know, when they're talking about the Jacobite period, and um, and so what that does is, with, when you're giving that to school kids. You know, yeah, 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 because we were talking like, you know, like young age, um, you, you know, like primary school. Um, let me see, that would be elementary school for, uh, for international uh, listeners. Um, yeah, you, you know, you know, so you know, so you're talking like seven, eight years old, and you're being told how much you've been shafted by the English, um, and then uh, you've got families telling them how much the English are bastards. As, um, this kind of feeds into um, the Scottish nationalist political um, debate as well that, that, that's currently ongoing is because the SNP they're not actually interested in independence they're interested in sti- like sticking it to the English all they want to do is stick it to the English then join the EU and then with the EU, they will happily just do as they're told uh, by, by, by the EU. They're not actually interested in self, like, like determining their own future. I'm talking about the SNP party. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, um, there's a lot of people uh, are suffering way, a delusion. The Scottish National Party, just so people know. Yeah, yep. yep. um, I'm kind of moving right on to the SNP here, uh, the Scottish National Party, um, which is modern-day politics. Um, 
Was there anything in between you were you were, you were wanting me to go over, or or will I just go into politics? No, no, no. I think it's proceeding okay. It's fine. Right. Okay. Um, the Scottish National Party. They get support internationally by people who think they're a national. Uh, they're, they're nationalists. You know, you know, it's like they're standing up for the people. That's the narrative. That's the official narrative. And indeed, when the SNP were formed, they were a nationalist movement. And the whole idea was uh, nationalism. And to be more precise, um, national socialism. Hmm. Um, the founders of the SNP were put in jail during World War Two because they were sympathetic to Adolf Hitler. Hmm. Interesting. Didn't know that. Now, the SNP symbol is a modification uh, of, of of a rune. Uh, I've forgotten which one it is. I should have done my homework before coming on. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, uh, but, but yeah, you, you know, that's, that's, um, that's how much the, uh, they, they were believing in the nationalist cause. And what's happened with the modern SNP is they've done a pendulum swing because after World War Two the Churchill got voted out and there was a landslide for the Labour Party. The Labour Party is the mainstream left leaning party in Britain. And they got a lot of support when they set up the NHS, the National Health Service. And what the politicians could see was rather than sticking to conviction, they wanted the support of the people. And there was, uh, I think it was like a changing of the guard, you could call it, and and so there there, there was like replacements for who was actually in charge of of, of the party. And they were Marxist. So the pendulum swung completely the other way to being as left as you could possibly conceive. Full full socialist. And there's a lot of people, especially internationally, uh, you know, this, is, this is the irony of all this, uh, you know, is that there's people who they're going, yes, yeah, Scottish National Party, yeah, good for you. You know, so I hope you get your independence soon. And it's like, so you're, you're talking about right-wing nationals who are voicing their support for an extreme left-wing socialist party. Yeah. It's, and it's it's all a big con, right? It, it's um they're not actually interested in like like the and the the, the the nation of Scotland. It's got a um, a very ironic parallel with when I was talking about the militant Marxists that, hi that, that hijacked the cause of Irish nationalism, then it's like, uh, the consolation prize we've got is at least the Marxists in Scotland, at least at this point in time, are not militant. That's the consolation we've got. You know, so, 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 so at least they're, they're doing everything by um, like, like getting votes and getting people into Parliament. You know, you know, so you know, like I say, it's, it may be a small consolation for some people, but it's still a consolation. You know, you know, we're not talking violence here. But um, that means that um, the cause for Scottish independence was hijacked, I, uh, and that's why it had largely been ignored. Um. It got a resurgence basically because of the conceit and arrogance of the political class who assumed that um, there is no third option. You know, you can vote right wing. You know, the right wings are supposed to vote Tory. The left wings are supposed to vote Labour. And sure, other parties can exist, but nobody's going to vote for them. Uh, except... Um, 
the SNP, there's a lot of things you can say about them, but stupid is not one of the things to lay at their door. Um, <clears throat> so, 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 so they could actually form an effective campaign based on the inadequacies of modern politicians. And then the big shockwave was that they actually swept to power like a total landslide, kicked everybody's ass. We, uh, in, in Scotland, uh, obviously I'm talking about, they won every um, parliamentary seat, I think with the exception of two, uh, for, for Scotland. They totally land... Uh, you know, you know, you know they, they totally destroyed everybody else, and this was a shock wave in, in Westminster, you know, like in London. Um, of course, what the SNP thought that meant was everybody wants independence. It's not what they were wanting; they were just wanting to stick it to the politicians, and they were prepared to give the SNP a chance as long as they did their job and run Scotland better than uh, than the Tories or Labour. And um, the SNP totally blew it. They totally blew it. And what it was, see, when they first started, it seemed good. They seemed to be making good decisions, right decisions. Some of it was a bit dodgy, but you could put up with that considering how how much of a failure a lot of the um, previous politicians had been. But then they took their eye off the ball. Uh, They decided to push for a a referendum on independence. They got their referendum, they lost it. And since they lost that referendum, they've just been down the pan ever since. Because all they've been doing is spending their time and resources trying to t- trying to see by hook or by crook if they can arrange another independence referendum. And while they've been doing that, the education system, the the health system, uh, policing, they've all been going down the pan. Uh, and so the reputation of the Scottish National Party in Scotland is now manure. It is complete, utter filth. The, oh, the people who are supporting it are the people who would vote for them anyway, or how bad they were. Question in all of this, uh, this realm of modern politics, the thing that I think seems to be an interesting contrast, and only you could actually speak on it, as you've experienced both, is that as many people are concerned by the demographic shifts in their countries, uh, Scotland is just not nearly as affected by uh, the enrichment, for example, that England, particularly large urban centres of England, is being, being affected by. Would you confirm this? Uh, yes, yeah. It's, um, well, how's about we use your John O'Groats as, your, as our example? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing there, so yeah, yeah good Remember- example. Where would you apply for a job? I seem to remember some vague construction going on. I don't know. That was about it. If there's nothing there, there's no jobs. See, so also the weather is a bit colder than it is in England. Um, I like it, but I, yeah. Sure. Yes, yeah, I, I think on average it's it's uh, it's about five degrees. It can be five degrees cooler in Scotland. Yeah. Um, but um, but if you've got uh, people coming from Somalia, for instance, um, or or Pakistan or or Syria, it's cold. It's cold for them. Um, the yeah, it's an interesting theory. Although I'm wondering because you see they have problems in Scandinavia too, but they don't. Hmm. Well, perhaps because I mean. I mean, there, there are more. Co- when it comes to temperature, la- uh, latitude is not the only issue. There are other things, proximity to ocean, and yeah, Scotland can definitely pretty cold, be pretty cold. Do you think that actually acts as a, a ward against third world immigration? Sorry, could you, could you ask that again? Do you actually think that the colder temperatures there act as a kind of ward against third world immigration? 
It, no, no. As, as I, I should I better explain what, what I'm what I'm kind of heading to. Um, maybe I was going to be t- building up to it too long. <laughs> um, right. Um, basically, uh, there's a bit of a trend of immigrants being housed or, or located in Scotland. There are no jobs. It's cold. Um, it, it rains quite a lot. Um, so they head south into the cities in England um, looking for work um, or disappearing into the black economy. And um, also, rem- remember that sectarianism? Yeah. Uh, the um, Protestants and Catholics. Well, you bring in somebody who is a completely different culture and like I say the majority of the population will be perfectly fine with them and won't have an issue with them as long as they don't create trouble which is an important aside as long as they don't create trouble they'll be fine but there's also equally there's still a significant percentage of the population, it's a minority but it's still significant enough that they will pick on them just as much as they would pick on a Catholic or vice versa or, or, or a Protestant. Then it's like then it's, oh look, here, here's, here's a free pass, we can have some entertainment with this motherfucker. You know what I mean? It's, it's um, um, and, and, and so you're effectively setting them up for a life of misery by locating because they're not getting located in the rich rich parts of town they're getting located in in like a council estate and the council estate is where all the poor people are and if people have a perception that uh, that they're all fighting for the same resources um even if they're, even if they're not like, that's not ne- that's not what's happening but if that's their perception then they will go. Well, it's me or you, pal. Fuck you. And uh, and so there's people who I don't know how accurate uh, actual um, their actual accounts have been, but there are cases of people who have come from somewhere like Somalia, for instance, who've said um, they're actually having a worse life in Scotland than in Somalia, and yet and yet. I'm talking about people who are allegedly not just um, not just financial uh, migrants. You know, these are people who are, who are supposed to be um, like like genuine uh, refugees. And uh, you know, I I don't actually know precisely how accurate that is, or or if that's a hyperbole. But 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 certainly that's how it's been reported. Um, so so I'm kind of going to jump a little bit. Um, it's a bit like in general, there's a brain drain happening from Scotland because if you've got the, like things like the internet, you're seeing how good the world is. You're seeing how awesome it is in these other places. Young people want to experience that excitement. And you look out the window. It's grey. It's raining. <laughs> I like it, but hey, I'm oh, worried. Uh... It's uh, what shall we say? Refreshing. Yeah. Uh, but um, but 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 if you're think looking out the window, thinking your prospect is that you've got this for the rest of your life, and if you're lucky, you will you will be able to keep your job down the baker's until you retire. It's it's like it feels like a dead end life. They, they go online and they see everybody having oh, what they what looks like fun, it looks like excitement. It looks like there's there's this whole life that they're not experiencing, so they're going to head down south too or or abroad. And um, and what that means is there's no reason for businesses to invest in Scotland because the people are prepared to travel. It's it's like um, I spent a lot of time in London. That was because that's where the work is. It's not that I wanted to abandon Scotland and uh, and and, so, and I hate the place. I love the place. You know, it's like, uh, uh, but but you is. Yeah, no, I continue. I, I understand. But I, I think we've talked about this 
on the Discord server, but um, I remember even in the late 90s when I was traveling in Scotland and I went to the Outer Hebrides and I went to Stornoway and got in this conversation with a pretty old guy at the time, I guess he's deceased now, about how the young people are just sort of leaving. Uh, and this was 20 years ago, give or take. Um, there's, 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 there's nothing there. Peat farming? I mean, I can only imagine how bad it is now. But yeah, yeah. Would you say that's the the, the descriptions you've been giving are even accurate of a place like Glasgow? Because Glasgow is the, yeah, the third largest city in the entirety of the United uh, Kingdom. Or is it really just to more rural, apply to more rural areas, would you say? Well, yeah, I, th I think it would be a trickle towards uh, metropolitan areas. I, uh, you know, because you've got you've still got places like you know, like Dundee, for instance. There's absolutely nothing in Dundee. It is the hang on, a, a, a better, a better watch. Otherwise, you'll, you'll you'll end up getting hate hate messages in your in your <laughs> in your comment section. Um, let's let, let, let's say um, I cannot think of a, a single reason to go to Dundee, and, unless you're going to like work for Rockstar Games or something. I, I, you know, there's they've got game development there, but um, if you're talking about social life, um, it's it's just it's one of these places where it's been built up, uh, but they've not put in any th any thoughts into amenities or people having a social life. You know, so so there is it's logical then for people there to go. Well, um, Edinburgh's not that far away. Let's go to Edinburgh. Mm. Then, you know, you know, and then on the west side to Glasgow. You know, you know, it's like Aberdeen used to be thriving. It's kind of slowing down because North Sea oil is, is has has um, almost died. <laughs> and you know, you know, so 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 Aberdeen is then is is then going to. Um, be losing a lot of its ex experts, you know, and specialists. Um, but then, you know, you know, so so then you've got that trickle down effect, um, which unfortunately is is um, happening with people rather than the economy. Um, and um, then you've got these concentrations of people, like say Glasgow and Edinburgh, and even there, it's still not actually. It's not a city the way you would imagine a normal city to be, and what I mean by that is um, they're they're simply not as big as uh, as because people think of cities, they think of London, New York, Paris. It, you know, they think something capital, and um, until they get there and they realise it's a filthy shit. Well, home, but. <laughs> well, well, you see, that's the thing: is is the what you're going to do? Move move to Glasgow. Get a job in McDonald's and and then uh, fo phone home to your parents and tell them how awesome your life is. Uh, you, you know, or are you going to try to take the bigger chance and move to a bigger city to see, to see if something better can happen? Hmm. Sure, I mean it, it, it does make sense, certainly. You, you know, so 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 there is. Uh, uh, I'm probably exaggerating a bit. I, 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 you know, in, in terms of brain drain, because, because there's a lot of um, innovation still happening in Scotland, uh, you know, and, uh, and there's plenty of people who are like starting up their own businesses, uh, you, uh, you know. But but if you're talking about international business, then they're not really looking to locate in Scotland. You know, you know, that's that's probably the easiest way to summarise it. You know, so indiv individuals um, are are being inventive enough to to, to perhaps uh, start up their own business and and get something going that can maybe feed them their family and if it expands then it can maybe employ like half a dozen a dozen people perhaps you know you know so, so there's lots of like small business like that happening but um but but if you're just like like somebody who's well what shall we say someone who's average who doesn't have any of their own ideas then you're kind of looking at well I'm trying to get you, you. You you're trying to be a shop assistant, right? And this kind of ties into some other things, which means that the perception of the immigration problem, well, as you just eff effectively described, I mean, Scotland doesn't have the same immigration problem that England does, and so the perception of that must be in the majority, you know, 
not as bad. Um, yeah. I mean, surely this is a, a major difference, but also, and you know, we, we talked about nationalism and, and certainly the alt-right. I mean, where do you, as a Scotsman, who, who's experienced both England and Scotland, where do you stand on the, the pressing issues that affect Europe uh, generally and more specifically Great Britain, particularly with Muslim immigration? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll maybe start with, with, with the Scottish attitude to begin with. Um, the thing that is the misconception in Scotland is they keep thinking they're already a separate country. Yeah, you know, because like I'm saying about how how kids get taught right from what you know, you know, people when they're taught right from when they're they're they're, they're young, it's, it's um you, you know that you know it's like the country of Scotland, and it's um yeah, there's this sort of, um what shall we say insular feeling where they don't look at the big picture of the United Kingdom, you know, and, unless it suits them. You know, so if they've got a grievance, it's, it's England's fault. But if England's got a problem, well, that's that's their problem. It's not ours. <laughs> you know. So as far as, um, like for instance, the Scottish National Party, as far as they're concerned, there should be no borders. Everybody's welcome to Scotland. And it's like, but but of course, the, that's not Scotland they're talking about. That's the United Kingdom. And so if you're talking about open borders, everybody, just like there's the people wanting to move. To, to, to like um, England for jobs internationally people aren't wanting to move to Scotland, they're wanting to move to where the jobs are too, or where they think the jobs are um, and um, and so they just don't actually they'll, you know, because they'll see things like oh, they've housed a, a smiling family over there and they've got 12 kids, yeah amazing that isn't it, and you, know, you, you, you know it's um they don't see the 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 formulation of of ghettos that that a ghetto is maybe a slight exaggeration, but um, uh, but 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 that's kind of like the what, what shall we say the online colloquialism that that gets used these days uh, for for many parts of English cities. You, you know they're not really seeing that happening in Scotland, and so it's a bit like so they don't see immigration as a problem. Uh, but like I'm saying, but because it's part of the United Kingdom, they need to be looking, you know, or should I say one, should be looking at United Kingdom as a whole when they're talking about immigration. And when you've got something as, what shall we say, diverse as Islam. Um, diverse? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, right. Right. Now, how could it, how could I describe it? There's the the big um, watershed moment was Tony Blair when Tony Blair was in government. That was that was when things got out of hand, shall we say? You know, you know, because uh, of I'm aware that there's people who uh, in nationalist circles they'll they'll talk about how the problem started when uh, the 1950s when the car a uh, uh, there were people from the Caribbean where, where it came came in in large numbers, you know. And then in the 1970s, there was the Indian people from uh, that got kicked out of Uganda, um, and uh, and 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 so you've got people wanting to imagine oh this wonderful world as it was in like 19 canteen kind of thing, you know. It's uh, and it's like well that's that's not the world we live in though, you know. It's um no these that meant that there that there were communities formed. That were ethnically based, I, I, you know, like like for instance, you, you, you'd have like um, like Caribbean communities in London. Um, now, I'll, there there may have perhaps been more of like the Indian communities were perhaps based a bit more like in in, in a separate city, perhaps like Birmingham or Manchester, um, and and the, and and there were actually smaller but significant pockets. Uh, of groups of Indian communities uh, that, uh, that were put uh, like in Glasgow as well. Now, that was a big culture shock for a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, especially when we're talking like like the 1970s. Um, 
Or should I say 1970s, because that was the entire UK that was then starting to experience that. Um, it was a culture shock, but it wasn't a problem. It was just something that people had to adapt to, and they could adapt to. When I'm saying it's not a problem, you know, obviously... Uh, there, there were tensions, and 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 there'd be incidents, especially if you're talking like like the bigger cities like London. That that that, that then yes, uh, that, uh, there were tensions, and and these tensions still exist today. Tony Blair, what he did was he deliberately um, opened the doors uh, to immigration, and there was a uh, a memo that was leaked um, that confirmed that it was a deliberate plan to change the demographic of the British Isles. And Whose what that, plan? Sorry? Whose plan? Uh, the Tony Blair administration. Right, oh. so, so, so we're talking the 1990s. Hmm. Well, I know, but, but who... You think they came up with it on their own? Right, I'll 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 uh, I'll come to that. I'll okay. come to that. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, it's, just, it's just I'll finish off the point about uh, about uh, this. Unfortunately, I, I don't have the name to hand of, of of whose memo it was, but but it has been confirmed. Uh, you know, it's like people can Google it. It's it's like it's it's you know it, it's mainstream knowledge with mainstream media. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's not like some conspiracy blog somewhere that that, that come up with an idea, um, and. They, their idea was, you see, is that if they bring in a whole load of immigrants um, that are mainly um, relying on the welfare state, then that will stop the, the right wing, the Tories, from ever getting to power ever again. And that, and that was actually what the logic that was used in this internal memo eh, as, as to why... Uh, they would they would uh, have the border force stand down, and um, no, it's one of these things where people with any common sense are just kind of like looking at each other in disbelief, going, "You cannot be fucking serious." It's um, <laughs> you know, do you do you realise what that will do to the country? And um, you know, because we're not talking about. Um, issues with ethnicity. We're not talking about um, culture at this point. We're just talking about the infrastructure coping with a sudden swelling of the population. And you know, if you just look at it on that point alone, it was insane, totally insane. And yet they're telling us how this is going to benefit us and how great it's going to be. And don't you worry about a thing because Uncle Tony's got it sorted. <laughs> Right, and um, oh, as you can tell, I love the guy. Right, and um, and I suppose that was the catalyst for me to start to research um, and start researching um, because it was not logical. So, what is the real reason? Uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's like there's, they're not telling us the truth. So you know, so what's the real reason that, that you know why are they doing this? And 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 so that's when I started to, um, uh, g generally speaking, as an aside, um, I've done a lot of research anyway on things like the origins of civilization stuff. Like, you know, I love that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so from that side of things, I, w I was perfectly used to um, at, like looking things up. You know, because when we're talking about looking things up, uh, we are talking about the days before uh, the internet. Uh, was was commonly available, uh, you know. So so I didn't have an internet connection at home, anything like that. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it was it was a, it was a case of visiting the library, um, and you know, you know, because even when I I did get internet connection, there wasn't really a lot of of sources uh, that you could that you could just simply type in. You, you know, when it's it's like it wasn't like Google and uh, and um, Wikipedia that didn't exist at the time. A second later, it's telling you that you've that you've got thirty eight million hits on one word or something. You know, it's um, um, and so with the early days of the internet, you had to kind of know like that there was a bulletin board in existence. <laughs> you know, like, type in its IP address kind of thing. You know, it's um, and and oh, that's the thing. I I used to spend well, what was it? Well, you know, the good old dial up connections. 
I think it's between 120 and 150 pounds a month. That was my phone bill. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, just just because I was um, using the internet, you know, because because I was like trying and failing to 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 like get good 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 places to to, to source the information. Uh, you know, because because well, you know, you know how it is. It's like when you're working a day job. It's like it's it's not always convenient to to be able to head down to the library because the you know you know because they're open when you're working. You know. Yeah. Um, and so and so, yeah. So the internet has become a godsend, a total godsend, especially when people have done things like data dumps and stuff like that. It's it, you know, it's it's just it's made it's made things incredibly easy. Uh, and and yet, even, even though it's incredibly easy, it's it's amazing the number of people that even try. Yeah, uh, you know, well, that's uh, an issue I complain a, about often, but yeah, yeah. separate <laughs> issue. Um, so so, what did you uncover uh, in your research? Well, um, oh no! Here, here, here's the thing. It's, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to think. Well, okay, just speak so your mind freely. No one will. Are we? What, are we about, about like getting flagged and stuff? All that sort of stuff is a, um, right? You know, Obviously, uh, people in conspiracy circles, let's, let, let, let's perhaps start by phrasing it that way, um, are aware of conspiracy theories in relation to um, what, the, what the European Union is really about, and is there some sort of master plan. Um, now, I never actually come across that immediately, uh, because I had started... Sort of like conversations, you know, like 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 sort of like I think it was Microsoft Messenger or something like that, or ICQ. Uh, there was a program called ICQ that that, that I used to use. I, I used to spend a lot of time on that, chatting with people. Uh, you know, you know, so so it was like text exchanges, and um, I suddenly realised that um, researching the Holocaust. Uh, it was an issue in, in many European countries because because I grew up in Britain. I never I never even realised that that was an issue, um, and so I kind of got distracted from well not distracted, channeled uh, down down the route of well why why is what you know, you know so so why is there a ban on all this stuff uh, being being questioned? Uh, I was from the starting point of um, that it's ridiculous because it's so obvious uh, all the evidence that's out there. Um, there was a TV feature. Oh God! So, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm being so vague. Um, but uh, there was there was some guy on on a show. No, no. This is not uh, who was. Uh, Saying that the gas chambers never existed. No, this was separate to like the um, uh, the, the the American stuff. I'm talking about. This this this, this was this was something in Britain uh, that that they, that that was actually televised. You, you know, it was it was something like on ITV or something. You know, like on one of the independent channels. And um, and I was sitting laughing at this at this show. And how could they let these crackpots on? You know, like talk, talk, you know, like talk, talk, talking about how how there were no gas chambers. Absolute, <laughs> you know, it's like fucking morons. You know, so like even 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 the school kids know all this stuff. Um, I see, and 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 I think I mentioned that show to somebody in in one of my chats, and they're going, "Well, yeah, we can't. We, you know, we're not allowed to. Um, we're not allowed to talk about that here." And I was like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> you know, and and it's like. It's like you mean you're at, it's actually illegal to ask questions about history, you know? Yeah, you know. It's, uh, and yeah, I'm saying, but we're taught this at school. You know what? You, what do you mean? This is you know this is ridiculous. And um, and so that's how I started look, looking into it. And so because I was interested in like military history and and, and history in general, you know, like history of civilization, you know, you know, then this is like, well, you know, we never got any of this at school, you know, like. like and so I was, so I was thinking, so, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to put their mind at rest anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to confirm to them that it's like they don't need to worry about anything, uh, you know. And and, um, and so I was doing like the, what you could call like the, the traditional, 
the traditional uh, research. Uh, I'm you, sorry you know, to interrupt, but but this is linked to the Tony Blair uh, intention that we spoke of earlier. Yes. I better cut the short then. Uh, right. Um, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm just I'm just trying to keep some direction here. That's all. I, I just realised that um, yes, it does, but it'll take so long for me to actually lay this out the way I'm doing it. That um, okay, okay. Oh, um, right. It's probably easier if I hit the reset button. Um, I've done a lot of research, which is not just simply looking at conspiracy blogs. Uh, you know. Um, now, as far as what the EU is about, no, it's is. Now, the United States of Europe is, is something that's on people's lips right now because uh, there have been like fairly recent announcements that were kind of like, how, how will we describe it, vindicating um, that Brexit was a good idea, is, is maybe the understatement. You know, you're like wanting to form a European army. Um, they're wanting to, ha to have like um, a single um, monetary policy. Um, it's going to be obligatory for all member states to to adopt the euro. Um, you, you, you know, you know, there's a whole host of things that this that, that that's turning it a uh, full blast into um, a European socialist state. Hmm. And um, and at the time that Tony Blair made his decision was part of our getting in line with the plans for this European state. And um, that meant that um, see, there's, 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 there's a slight problem in I could say something in two sentences but it's going to sound so mad. Without, no, it's okay. Without, it's fine. Just say it. Okay, okay, right. Um, the influx of Muslim immigrants, in my opinion, is a deliberate plan. Well, I'm say mad. Uh, it doesn't sound it, mad. I'm specifying Muslim immigrants, not immigrants, specifically Muslim immigrants, and. An assumption I've made based on, well, like the the plans implemented under the Tony Blair regime or well, regime that's the wrong word sorry um uh, administration Freud and stuff there, um I, then then that suggests to me that they were fully on board as 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 being like pay, like signed up members to to for want of a better phrase a master plan like the, you know that that, that was that was Europe wide um. No, I'm going to if, right. If, if I'm if I'm going to just like shorthand this to to save a bit of time, um, you know, because obviously you know you know I I, I could like elucidate, but but it would take quite a long time. And, you know, so 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 that's that's my main concern. And obviously, we, I'm aware we've been talking for a while already, um, and 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 it's um right now. I have I have my my my. Con well, I would say conclusions, but should I say my current understanding? Because I'm happy to change my view when fresh evidence presents itself. But based on the information that I have at, at the time of speaking, um, there's actually a desire by the, a European political elite, not necessarily all of them, but certainly a cabal of them, um, that they would actually prefer to have a Muslim population in Europe. Why do you think that is? Because they're easier to control. Um, now, you, you see, because, because the, the, the method of control for controlling Muslims is all you need is to have the imams in your pocket. You tell the imams what to do, they tell the, the, the Muslim uh, congregation that's the will of Allah, and most of them will... To, to be fair, the fact that 
no mainstream European politician really in any country has offered, unless you want to consider Herod Wilders in the Netherlands mainstream, but he's sort of not, anyone who's gotten elected and is in office, and most mainstream politicians, they offer no no critique, no criticism, no resistance to this uh, mass influx of, of Islam in general. I mean, it certainly would go in, coincide with your theory, because, you know, why... If, if that's the goal, then yeah, why would you criticize it publicly? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, and, and again, there's this... The drive seems to be that it's imperative for the existing uh, population to adapt towards Islam rather than expecting the immigrants to assimilate with the existing population. And this kind of coincides with some alt-right theories, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, I, I, suppo I suppose um, th this has perhaps become a cliche with many people that, uh, that actually start talking about stuff. But I'll say it anyway, because this is my current belief. Mm -hmm. I'm not an alt-writer. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I, um, this elite, I have to ask the obligatory question. Are they all Jews? Or are they? <laughs> oh, oh no. Um, that having been said, it, it doesn't mean that there are no Jews involved. Hmm. Um, you see, that's the thing. I have a lot of issues with uh, the alt right. Um, I a lot of the problems that they say, say are problems that exist. I agree are problems. Where I disagree is. I just don't believe that their solutions are necessarily the right way forward, and 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 so that's where I've I've got um, contention. That's why I don't consider myself alt right because I'm not signed up to to like. I don't think a pure ethno state would be a solution, for instance. Uh, you know, it's, it's um because the the alt, the alt right. Um, here it's like the alt right is so fragmented anyway that 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 that, that as soon as you start saying the alt right this or the alt right that, then you're talking about probably ninety five percent of them would actually disagree with you. <laughs> you, you. You know, it's it's just not organised. Hmm. Um, it's also um, an online presence. I, I I you know you know so so it, a lot of the alt right, in my opinion, I just say in my opinion, um, it's. It's an online circle jerk. Um, that they're in their own bubble, and then they're arguing with other people that are from another bubble. And it's like it's like the majority of the population don't even listen to the news, right? And even smaller person, it, it, it's it's a bit like look at the number of people who who watch YouTube every day, and what percentage of that watch politics on YouTube? Very small one. And what percentage of the people who watch politics? actually even listen to anything the alt-right have got to say tiny absolutely tiny now it does that doesn't that does not um trivialize the issues but it means that people need a reality check if they think that they're in a position of influence and and like I say, I agree with a lot of the things that many people that identify as alt-right say are problems. W so, which things specifically? Right. Now, well, the quote-unquote white genocide, right, uh, that um, the alt-right will refer to white genocide. Surprise, surprise, um, the Marxist-driven left say it doesn't exist. Um Well, even Sargon says it doesn't exist. Well, then why? Right, right. If if we if if we just use uh, the migrants into into mainland Europe as as, as just just as a um, uh, well, an example, right? So you've got what a million a million mostly Muslim uh, immigrants into Germany. And, and, and like last year was it? Mm -hmm. 
um, how many of them were women? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aware. I mean, I'm not necessarily disputing the claim. Uh, yeah. There, obviously, I, I, no, I don't actually. Oh, sorry, I, I wasn't expecting you to have a percentage. By the way, <laughs> it was just, it was just like, um, in, in percentage terms, it's relatively negligible, right? So because. Um, now, a lot of people will keep referring to fighting age um, Muslim men uh, be, be like like coming in coming into Europe in their droves. It's like technically speaking, that's right. right they're fighting age, but they're not here to fight. That's a bit of a misnomer. Um, what you've got is men in their virile prime being imported into Europe on an industrial scale. Now, unless they're all gay, they're going to have needs. And, um... <laughs> I just like the way you phrase it, unless they're all gay. Yeah, so, so, although... So, although it's... Cr it's outrageous, the crimes that are happening... You know, you know, like the, the sex crimes, etc. Mm. Any normal person would surely would say, what do you think is going to happen if you bring in an army of virile men without any women? What do you think is going to happen? Now, is that deliberate or is that absolute stupidity? No. I have I I I don't actually have evidence, but surely, if I can work out that it's as plain as day as that, then the decision makers surely can work out the same thing. And this this would be the elite that's orchestrating this. These elites that. It, yeah, it's a, now because here we've got um, like well the the European Commission. Um, who then talk to the leaders of each European country. And right, so, so, uh, sorry, we're running out of time. So, white replacement, that's something you agree about with the alt-right. Anything else? Do you believe that Jews are, are the fundamental problem to almost every issue in the West, or some, or...? There, um, there is a contributing factor. Um, I would say the bigger problem uh, is evangelical Christians who support uh, the Jewish Zionist cause. Um, as, uh, you well, know, that's mostly an American thing. That's not a European thing. Is, but that's but that's why um, Israel can do no wrong in American eyes. Is that that's why they get um, support no matter what they do. Okay, well, that's Israel. I mean, unless you do, you think? I mean, is Israel behind the European white replacement? Do you think? Or I, I don't know. I'm just ask, asking. Right. Um, right. What, basically, what, what what I'm driving at here is, um, right. Yeah, it's, there are evangelical Christians. Right. So, so basically, there are more Christians in the Zionist movement than there are Jews. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, and and what they're basically doing is they they think that if they can get all the Jews back into um, uh, the promised land, then the rapture will come, and and, uh, and 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 so they think they are fulfilling Bible prophecy if they do that. And um, then you've got the Jews who um, uh, have got their reasons for for uh, wanting to establish a homeland. It's like, and and so you've got that happening right now. Now, what you have to do is you have to kind of wind the clock back a bit and look at the setting up. Of uh, the, the the sort of European Union. Um, now, there were several plans that were kind of circulating um, in the um, earlier part of the 20th century. Uh, you, you know, so so we're, we're talking even like the interwar period. Uh, you know, it's like because people are like the world. The World War One had happened. People are trying to work out ways. To make sure that something like that can't happen again, and um, and there's ideas I, I sort of like floating around. I, I you know it's like there's, there's communism, Marxism, 
you know, national socialism. You, you, know, you know, it's like there's all, you know, there's so many things flying around. Um, now, there was a, an aristocrat um, who was um, not Kudnov Kalergi. Now, he was just one of the guys. There were several people who came up with a similar plan. And it's a bit ironic uh, considering um, if, 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 if people have been watching, like, uh, new YouTube events, uh, there's been a debate about uh, race realism uh, been going on. And yet, certainly back in, back in the 1920s, everybody accepted race realism. Um, and so all sides were working out their political theories based on the fact that, that race is real. Um, and so what you had was you had like bunches of people who like so so maybe on one extreme you might have say Adolf Hitler he comes up with the idea that um, uh, well we need to make a we, we, we can make a super ra you know, a race of super Aryans um, you know, so you've got Marxists who are saying yes uh, we need a new man too um, uh, but then you've also got a group of people who are thinking well. These Europeans, they're, they've, they've um, got a lot of fight in them. How can we actually get rid of that fight? And a potential solution is we need to interbreed them so that they're not pure European. That way, the European fight will actually be taken out of them. And there were, like I say, incredibly, there were, I think, four different plans that are in, that are in, in fairly common knowledge. Uh, they all come up with that similar sort of sort of pattern, you know, a, a similar sort of idea that um, that the European needs to have his um, well, what shall we say, um, his his genes diluted, and um, and, and could this not is being directed by the Jews, yes. Three of those authors were Jews. One was not. Hmm. No. I, I, I don't. I, sorry, I don't actually have the names to hand. Um, Kudnov Kalerg is the one I keep mentioning because because he he's actually the one that was that was not a Jew. So he so he generally gets credit for the plan because he's the non-Jew that can kind of front it. Um, now, if if you look at the circles he was in, um, then you know then you're then you're talking like things like connections to Rothschilds and people like that and so people can either go strictly on the facts and say he was not a Jew so, so therefore the Jews have got nothing to do with it or you can look and go oh he had a lot of banker friends who were Jews maybe they were discussing it after dinner you, you, you know it's like that, that sort of stuff Pe people are kind of drawing their own conclusions because there's no actual so, so let me just you know, so basically your belief is that some version of the clergy plan I'm familiar with it. by the way Maybe I should bother explaining what that is. So, Kalergi Plan, um, I believe he was half Japanese, if I remember right. That's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so he's half Austrian, half Austrian, half Japanese. This idea that uh, Europe is has so many problems and the only way it can deal with these problems is that it should be sort of mixed with the rest of the world, basically. That's a really simplified way of explaining it. Um, but effectively, you believe that the clergy plan is is being conducted and played out as right now today. Right. Um, the quick answer is yes, um, but 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 I would like to qualify it as well. If that's all right. Sure. <laughs> um, right. Um, now, clergy, um, he designed the the European flag. He chose the European anthem uh, every year. No, sorry, it's every two years, isn't it? Um, there's a, a Kalergi Prize uh, awarded to a, a person of significance, usually a politician, um, for work towards uh, the unity of Europe. The official website of the Kugnov Kalergi Award. Um, I've looked through it with a fine tooth comb and I cannot find a single disavowment of Kalergi's beliefs. 
that, 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 that he wrote down in the 1920s. And so right. while it doesn't openly say that it's actively trying to implement the Kalergi plan, it does not disavow it. And so, and so there is a degree of coming to conclusions here rather than that I've got a, some sort of smoking gun. Uh, but, but, but like I say, I've, I've, I've been through, well, I should I say, I've been through the, the English version uh, of, of the website. Um, okay. and, 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 um, and so my understanding is that the elites are. Now, I just want to, I just want to, uh, flag, I don't mean flag, you know, flag this, but. Are, you're not using at least interchangeably with Jews, or is it the same thing to you? It's not interchangeable. No, okay. no. Um, there are Jews involved, and now this might sound a bit conspiracy theory, um, but there are people that would perhaps be the faces of a movement. But they are not necessarily the power of the movement, um, and so you can see that there's high-level bankers, international bankers, are involved in the movement. You, you, you know, you know that, that are part of this elite, yeah. and many of the international bankers are Jewish, um, and we're usually talking about. Um, high-level politicians being the other members or members of the aristocracy class uh, of, of, of European countries. As I, now, and again, if, if you're talking percentages, then Jews are technically overrepresented. Um, but if you're talking about the number of people involved in the, the elite class, then the Jews are still a minority. I see. Um, so, so, so by all means, it's like, so when I'm so so when I'm talking about the elite class, I it's not a case of, it, you know, like oh, it's those damn Jews. Right. Uh, you know, right. that 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 that's something I've actually got a bit of an issue about uh, with the alt right. Um, so. Is, but I mean, there you just mentioned so the white replacement. I mean, whatever, however you want to term it, I'll call it white replacement. Uh, that part being part of a, a bigger plan. Anything else that you'd say coincides with alt right views? No. Again, I know this is going to sound that this is not going to sound politically correct. Uh, but if I'm, uh, if I'm going to mind, that's right. Why you're here, right? Yeah. Um. There is a major problem with the Islamic religion that needs dealing with. Um, now, this is again, this is a bit similar to how you could look at the population in Northern Ireland, how not all of them are activists, but 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 they're all lumped together as one side or the other. Mm. Then there's many many Muslims who. All they want to do is is pay for their mortgage and feed their kids. However, Islam itself, um, I do not actually consider a proper religion. Now, there's obviously it's a religion for millions of people. You know, it's also a political system. I mean, you know, well, well, well you, you see that that's the thing. I I think it should be recognised. Um, it, as a political ideology, it's a because it's a political ideology masquerading as a religion, and so it should be given the same scrutiny as the Nazis and the communists. That is how big a problem I believe it is. I agree. I do think it's kind of an, basically the number one problem in Europe right now. Um, but once again, maybe you're right about your your theory. Maybe you're wrong. No mainstream policy. So, for I'll give you an example of the contrast, right? So, people will say, mainstream politicians will say, well, immigration is good, migrants are good because it's new labor and it, it boosts the economy. Now, I think you could dispute that, but no mainstream politician, 
by way of contrast, comes on and says, Islam is good because of X benefit. That you can talk about the economic benefits of migration until you're blue in the face. But nobody says, well, Islam is great for Europe because of reason X. They, they can't decide a reason because it's not. It, you can't even offer a, a superficial argument for that, actually. Well, uh, would you believe uh, Theresa May, who is, is our, my current prime minister, when she was home secretary, she made the statement, and I shit you not, she said, Sharia is good for Britain. Uh, did she follow up on that, or was it only... It was Well, what she was talking about was um, Sharia courts, and what and her logic, well, A, is, uh, is the, the perpetual appeasement of, of Muslim populations. But, you know, that, that's always priority one, appease the Muslim. Um, mm-hmm. And the, number two was saving money. So how she saw it is if the Sharia courts, well, well officially they call them Sharia councils in Britain, uh, you know, because, oh, it's not a court. You know, court, courts are, are, are for the government. Um, but it's basically like non-criminal matters, you know, you know, like, like, like domestic issues, like marital disputes, um, uh, uh, you know, you like are dealing with inheritance, uh, uh, you know, issues like that. Then the British government's mm-hmm. perfectly happy for Sharia courts to decide that stuff, because it saves the administration costs of it happening in 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 the British court system. You you know, so so the, the cynical reason would be they're just wanting to save money, so they don't don't really give a crap what that actually means for the society that that the people are living in. Well, they're also not giving a crap about how poorly women get treated by these Sharia courts as well. Well, I think that's actually uh, pretty compelling. I think that in as much as there's an elite, shadowy or not, they're so- certainly not interested in things like historical or cultural preservation. And even if they actually believe ultimately that all this enrichment is economically beneficial, I think they would be of the mind... Uh, and I'm, I'm not necessarily subscribing to your theory or not. I'm just trying to be open-minded that, that yeah, it doesn't really matter. As long as the economy keeps on going, you can have any legal system or not. You can multiple legal systems. It just doesn't matter. As long as the economic machine keeps on chugging along. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that at the very least, they, they, they don't, they're not too worried about huge cultural shifts, um, in in our societies, and yeah, so well, well, see that's the thing that I, I think that's my overriding, uh, or, or should I say, my most powerful feeling as a desire to to preserve Western culture and civilization, and um, and so. While I, I mentioned earlier that I, I disagree with the alt right in terms of like an ethno state, um, one has to concede that in order to preserve a culture, you do need a majority of the population who who made that culture to actually be part of perpetuating that culture. So, so if you're actually going to destroy the demographic. Um, of the very people who made the culture that they want to live in, then the culture will be permanently damaged as a result too. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty accurate. You, you know, so so I I'm not sitting here wanting to be sitting with only white neighbours, but I want to be sitting with my neighbours wanting to live. In the same world I want to live in, well, like like the culture of the freedoms. Mm. No, I understand. I you know, understand. you know, it's like it was if Western culture and civilization is allowed to be eroded away, what is its replacement? Are people honestly thinking they're going to be happy either living under Sharia law, because it's either going to be that or it's going to be um, something like the Chinese? I, I governing as as a province. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, and and out of those three choices, uh, it's more of Western civilization, please, 
is um, people seem to forget just what the sacrifices were that, 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 that happened over the centuries to make all this happen. It did not happen overnight. It can be destroyed overnight. Um, but then that's... Well, th this might be too much of a tangent, but, but that's the um, neo-Marxist education system is bringing up people who actually want to see Rome fall. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm aware that's that, you know that, that that's probably too deep to to, to go into uh, I, in this conversation, but it's the, the I strongly believe that the, that there's been a deliberate plan to actually raise people. I that well, it's, it's this whole you have to be ashamed of of empire, you have to be ashamed of of achievements. As um, you know, why not take responsibility for? the wrongs, but take pride in the rights. You know, well, that would be a common sense uh, point of view, but it's not one uh, not one shared by the current generation, or a majority of them at least. Yeah, or why not just be neutral about everything and just try to try, be, acknowledge the past and live in the present and try to make some progress? Yeah. Even well, that. I could certainly do that for my lifetime. Uh, but it's kind of screwing everybody <laughs> in future lifetimes. Um, you, you know, but but the the problem is, I think people are waking up to this now, and the the big problem is that for like the past thirty years, uh, you know, two gen two full generations, um, this has been subversive propaganda that that's actually been part of uh, the education system right across the West, and. Where I believe this comes from is the fall of the Berlin Wall. The big mistake everybody made was the thought that was the defeat of the Soviet Union. It was not the defeat of the Soviet Union. It was... Now, there is actually a conspiracy theory which is that that, uh, that that was actually staged, that, that the collapse was staged. Uh, now, I don't know about that side of things, but what I can confirm is that at no time did the KGB stop their long-term program to infiltrate um, the positions of influence in the West. That never stopped. Mm. Well, I uh, mean... Hmm. You know, so now you've got um, professors uh, teaching kids and these professors are neo-Marxist, and they're supposed to be um, the eminent minds of the free world. And they've, they've set things up in such a way that if you dare to criticize them for something that's obvious to the average guy in the street that's actually that just uses an ounce of common sense, then you're you're sent to like an intellectual gulag. Yeah, you, you know, it's like. Your your reputation is destroyed, and once your reputation is destroyed, it doesn't matter how right you are; people will refuse to listen to you. Hmm. But I mean, uh, to fast forward a bit, uh, if you're accurate in your assessment of the alt right, and mainstream politicians have no interest in changing things, in fact, have if only because they're just apathetic. I think that probably is the best explanation. You know, as long as they see the money coming in, why would they care? Yeah, it's uh, I. Now, in all fairness to to politicians, you know, I've been rubbishing them quite a lot <laughs> today. Um, I'm not sitting here thinking politician equals evil. You see, it's like there's a lot of people that think that they are doing things for the right reason. Alternatively, they are just thinking short term. They're only thinking of what they can do to get off with their term in office, can they get well, voted? I mean, this, is, this is basically what Enoch Powell said in his Rivers of Blood speech that uh, about politicians, right? You know Enoch Powell and his Rivers of Blood I'm, speech. I'm trying to work out if I'm flattered or not with that. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, I mean that it's obvious that most politicians have their eye on the yeah, president yeah. and not no, thinking no, no, about... But, but that's the very thing. Look what I did there just now. I hedged my bets. Because Enoch Powell had, brings a reputation with it, I immediately hedged my bet. That was instinct, yeah. You, I, I, you know, it's like, and and that's that's social conditioning. Well, it's just common sense, really. 
everyone's not many people are thinking about posterity or long term politicians by their very nature are, are pulled by forces that require them to be concerned uh, about the next election and getting in and serving their term or their their second term or third or whatever um you know promises empty broken or not so yeah i, I and i think that's basically what it comes down to this is my view is that at least from what i can the evidence i can actually gather it's just mass apathy and people you know chasing their their offices and and just just being content that the bureaucracy is is sort of working vaguely, but not thinking about the long term consequences. Yeah, well, well, like I was saying a bit earlier, it's like most people in any country don't even bother to watch the news every night. Yeah, and, you know, it's only if there's like so, some disaster happens, they'll maybe switch on the news to see what it is. Yeah, uh, you, know, you know, so so that's how much people are actually uh, are actually caring. Yep. Anyway, anyway that, that, that's um, um uh, I, I think I've kind of dead ended the, uh, uh, the, the <laughs> no it's been it's been really it's been interesting it's been interesting I think uh entrance doesn't happen often uh, the the audience uh, at the very least learned a lot about Northern Ireland I think that that really uh, is uh, a major point of attraction in the conversation. Oh, that's grand. It, yeah, there's there are some rabbit holes that was probably best we didn't actually go down, but um. Yeah, there's... Well, like I said, I mean, you can take any subject and you can go into the nittiest, grittiest detail on it, but there are time limitations, there's the attention of the audience, and, you know, it, it really depends on the topic. I suspect this won't be a hugely popular video, but for those who are actually interested in the details of certain, certain things like contemporary Scottish politics or mm, the history or the, the nature of the troubles in Northern Ireland, as well as... Uh, my guests' uh, ideas about what's going on in Europe, and I think it's been a it's been a good conversation. Oh, I've just realised. Can I add an addendum? Uh, sure, some sort? sure. Um, because something that we've not covered that um, now, now that we've mentioned the alt right and stuff like that, um, there was um, a nationalist group called Scottish Dawn that got prescribed uh, as a terrorist organisation. I, I, the beginning of the year was it? I think uh, uh, you know, a year ago or more. And, um, and 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 so I had some thoughts on that stuff uh, because um, I did do some of my own videos, but um, it's kind of funny uh, when I when I tried to do my own videos. Once I pressed the record button, I was just so crap. I just could I just couldn't present it at all. Uh, you know, but I, I still tried. But the but the videos were terrible, so I I'm not recommending them. <laughs> but anyway, right. Um, now the problem is I. Uh, there, there, there was national action, and they got prescribed. Um, prescribed, uh, by the way, for people means that, that they're declared illegal and a terrorist organisation. If you try to join them uh, or associate with them, particularly, uh, then th that's that, that's a breach of terrorism laws. You know, so it's a very, very serious um, uh, thing to happen to to, to an organisation. Um, and again, internationally, a lot of people see these groups as being um, just sort of like they, they think they're like organisations that, that that are springing out of the alt right, and 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 I think that's unfair uh, because that because that's unnecessarily besmirching the alt right. Even though I disagree with them, uh, these groups are much more sinister, um, and their intentions are. Uh, more sinister too, and, and 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 what I mean by that is some of these groups have been courting, uh, 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 as in uh, getting in on the good side of Irish paramilitaries to kind of, and this kind of hooks up with the the perception that there's going to be a civil war against the Muslims. And what they've done is they've done a very stupid thing, very stupid thing. They've decided that the best people to get their expertise from are the people who've been fighting in, in Ireland. And that is going to get the hatred of the government and of the civilian population. Everybody is against that. Hmm. 
and um, and so I actually did a video where you know where, where it was the Scottish dawn. I'm sort of going, well, these guys they seem to be like. You know, you know, they seem to be a bit too neo-Nazi by my liking. You know, they had like blood and soil uh, actually splashed on their homepage and stuff like that. And you, you know, whereas everything was just too directly Nazi-inspired. Um, and, and you know, and they were effectively saying, "Well, well, we are the real Scottish nationalists." Uh, you, you know, like what what the SNP should have remained, kind of thing. You, you know, that you know, they were kind of having that vibe. And um, I was kind of like, I, I was like, well, this is just an excuse. You, you, you know, it's, it, yes, it's an extreme opinion, but but it's freedom of speech. You, you know, so, so, so I was kind of defending them on the freedom of speech basis. But then more information come to light. So, so, so I then did um, another video um, in which I then freely admitted that um, it was right to ban them. Uh, you know, so it was right to ban National Action, it was right to ban Scottish Dawn. And, well, there's a there's a court case currently ongoing, which which is um, if peop- if 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 there are convictions, then that would be conspiracies to commit political murders, and I cannot condemn that enough. I cannot condemn that enough. Uh, but um, so just because someone is it says they're they're of the right, you know, you're like like for instance, unite the right kind of kind kind of phrase that kind of came out of America. It's um be very careful. Just because someone says a right wing doesn't mean that they're that 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 they're just a meme lord. Um, well, yeah. These days, it's very difficult to tell what's legitimate and what's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, uh, you know, I'm, maybe I'm making that sound very um, preachy, but 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 believe me, that is not a road that we want to to start going down. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been talking for almost three hours, so uh, e- even if we could, time time is probably uh, not on our side right now. It, yeah, yes. Well, well, uh, as you can see, once it gets started, then I'm not going to shut up, am I? But it- <laughs> you recognize certain qualities you possess. That's not actually a bad thing, though. I mean, it's, it means you're going to be very, think- very detailed and go into great depth. So it's a, it's a good thing in many ways. Yeah. Oh no, no. It's, it's, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's, um, uh, that's the thing is uh, because originally I was thinking, no, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm wanting to talk about this, you know. It's, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I, I, uh, I, it's good to get things off your chest sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I felt like I even learned a bit about some of the nitty gritty details that went on in in Northern Ireland. I still want to visit there at some point in time, um, just to get a sense of the place. Uh, but, yeah, the, 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 there are, are actually taxi drivers that will give you uh, tours, uh, you know, to to um, visit points of significance. Hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah but it's, it's, it's one of these things. It's kind of funny for a lot of people because you're sort of like going down and you're going, but this is just a normal street. It's like yes, it's. It, it is a normal street. <laughs> you know, it's like these things were happening, in you, you know as. It's not like the movies, I, I, you know. You know, it's 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 not glamorous. It's ordinary, and it's terrifying. It's a, it, but but I, I better not start again. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like saying that. I, I, I like I like that. That's a good way to end the video. It's it's not glamorous. Sorry, it's not glamorous. It's uh, it's normal and it's terrifying. Something along those lines. That that seems. Yeah, yeah. It was it was. Uh, yeah, it's not like the movies. Yeah, it's it's not glamorous and it's bloody terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I can go with that. Everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to thank my guest, Jama, for joining me. I'm sure uh, I will encounter him soon again on that nefarious Discord server, which uh, serves to rob us of so much sleep and health, as it tends to do. So, And, uh, yeah, just uh, very informative, very detailed. I thank my guest, and, uh, yeah, uh, I will check you out later, I suppose. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.